So I'm a logger in northern BC, Canada. I'm an avid hunter and have spent many a nights hunting alone. That being said, quite a few years ago, I was working on a broken down skidder in the dark after everyone on the logging block was gone, changing a blown hydraulic hose under the cab, when I felt like I was being just watched or something. The feeling continued to get worse too and so I was sort of on edge and continued to work on replacing the blown hose. Every trip for tools to the service truck and back I would sort of scan for eyes in the nearby tree line, maybe about 25 meters away with my flashlight. There was nothing. I continued to work on the pain in the butt hose that you literally have to dive your head and upper body under the cab to reach and so your legs are sort of stuck up in the air and feeling vulnerable. And the feeling of being watched gets even more intense. All the hairs on my neck are standing and I hear a two-tone whistle from far away. Almost as if it was the wind. It was so far away, but it was flat and calm that day. Also, there was about six inches of fresh snow on the ground. But I pushed myself out from under the skidder and looked around quietly with a flashlight for eyes in the tree line and down the road. Again... There's nothing. I had one side of the hose fitting to remove still and it was the easier side and higher up so I wasn't sort of, I don't know, like butt up in the air trying to remove it. I put my head back under the cab and quickly began to spin the fitting loose and the feeling of being watched was now so bad that every hair on my body was standing and then I hear the same two-tone whistle very loudly in the tree line directly behind me. I had the hose off at the exact same time, so I whipped myself out from under the cab and turned ready to throw down with a, a 1 5 8 wrench in my hand, yelling, All right, where are ya? But there was nothing. No one there, no tracks, no eyes, no wind either. In fact, no sound whatsoever, which was really strange. The flashlight that I had was... More of a small floodlight for working on repair stuff, so it didn't really light up inside the trees or anything. But the next day, it had snowed another 6 inches or so, so I went up and hiked the tree line with a 12 gauge and 7 3 inch slugs ready to go. But there were no tracks that I could see. No perches on the trees where snow had have been pushed off or anything, if it was a bird. Nothing. But I definitely heard someone whistle or make a whistling sound of some sort. As I said, I'm an avid hunter and animals just don't make that sort of noise. I don't know, the whole situation was really weird and I don't know what to think about it. Maybe I'm just overreacting and maybe it was an animal, one that I just haven't come across yet or something. In any case, years later, this all happened about maybe seven kilometers down the road from the last incident. I was out hunting with a friend when we lost legal light, so we hiked back to the truck and we hit the road in his parents' new Ford half-ton, the ones with the sensors all over the vehicle. We had some music playing as we're just heading back towards town again when the music started acting sort of weird and cutting in and out with static, so me being in the passenger seat disconnected the Bluetooth and reconnected the phone. Music cleared up and we continued down the road. We got up to the kilometer board on the road that my previous encounter took place and I mentioned, Oh, hey, that's the whistle block that we logged a couple of years back. Half jokingly because I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. My friend replied, Great, thanks for that. As I told him the story before. But we continued slowly driving down the road because it gets pretty rough in a couple of spots and the road has a few sharp turns and an S-bend as well. Well, we go about a kilometer further and the music starts screeching and doing what we can only describe as like alien noises. So I disconnect the Bluetooth again and my friend says, Oh, mum's got a cord in here somewhere. So he stops and gets the cord for me. I plug the phone in and play the music again. Another kilometer down the road and the phone just goes absolutely mental. I mean like... Loud alien squealing and sounds similar to that terrible dial-up internet noise from the 90s. We had started into the S-Bend when this was happening and we shut the music off completely as we were driving still. 
making the one half of the S-turn, and then we both look up from the music deck or screen, and the headlight illuminates what I can only describe as a figure standing in the middle of the road. So we swerve and take the ditch a bit, still going probably, I don't know, like 30 kilometers an hour, and get the truck back up on the road. But we continue coasting down the road as we're both in awe after just seeing a flash of whatever this thing was. And I finally say after what seemed like five quiet minutes, man, did, did you just see that? My friend cuts me off and says, a skeleton in the middle of the road? I say, yeah, like a white rib cage and a deer skull for a face almost. He finishes. I said, turn around. What was that? Does someone need our help? Not thinking that we're in the middle of nowhere, with no vehicles around, mind you, or any that we had passed from other hunters or anything. It was early season and no one bow hunts here anyways. My friend said, I'm not turning around. Man, I feel sick, like I'm about to throw up. And he continued driving, thankfully without throwing up. We didn't see another vehicle until we hit pavement again. So, whatever this thing was, it was taller than the pickup by easily a couple of feet. I'm 6'1 and my forehead is at the top of the window for reference. It has black surrounding the white of the bones with sort of long arms half stretched to its side and it was standing there as if to say, try and hit me. I watched this thing pass the passenger window and stared up at it as we wailed by it and it was definitely three dimensional, tall with long arms and incredibly dark, dead looking, sort of like, I don't know, maybe it was just my eyes but like light was sort of sucked into it without reflecting anything. Hard to explain but that's the best way I can put it. When we hit service again though, my friend received a text message from his mother saying, what did you two idiots hit in my brand new truck? I guess the new Fords send near accident reports to the owner when the sensors pick up something. I'm an old school Chevy guy so I don't really know much about this but the only thing that I can find online that resembles what we both saw and I know this is pretty cringe, but is, well, a Wendigo, just without the antlers. Or just that the headlights, perhaps, didn't illuminate them or something. A few years back, we were having a brutally cold winter where we are, and the snow had frozen into ice and covered everything. It was pitch black in the backyard when I went to let my dog outside one last time before bed that evening. As we exited the house from the sliding door of the walkout basement and onto the lower deck, I felt that something was just off. Our house backs up to some woods, so I was accustomed to hearing noises from wildlife in the night. But this night was different for some reason. Nothing made a, a sound except the arctic cold wind, but... I had the feeling that I was being watched. The entire time my dog was in the backyard, I looked around sort of nervously, expecting a coyote or a other predator to pop out of the tree line or something. My dog did his business, but afterwards stopped and stared at the corner of the woods until I got creeped out and called him back inside. I quickly locked the sliding door and shut the curtains, unable to shake the uneasy feeling that I had outside. After double and triple checking all of the locks in the house, I ended up just going to bed. Around three in the morning though, I hear the muffled sound of my dog barking from the basement two floors below. I got up, sort of stumbled down three flights of stairs and found him standing at the basement sliding door. He was peeking his head through the closed curtains, barking his head off with the hair standing up all along his back. I tried calling him away from the door, but he just wouldn't let up. I dreaded peeking out of the curtain to see what he was barking at after the uneasy feeling that I had earlier in the night. But finally, I held my breath and I swiped the curtain aside. I peered into the inky blackness, but saw nothing to cause any alarm. A wave of relief washed over me and I figured that it must have been a deer or a raccoon in the yard that set him off or something. 
He whined at the door for a few more minutes until I eventually bribed him upstairs with a dog cookie. I went back to bed and thankfully I wasn't disturbed again. That is, until the morning when I went to the basement to let out the dog. I opened the sliding door and walked out onto the deck as he bounded into the snow. And my blood ran as cold as the sub-zero morning temperatures when I looked down. Because there, frozen into the ice on the deck, was a set of bare human footprints. They were very clear and I could even make out each toe on the person's foot. The prints were large though and appeared to be from an adult male I would guess. Looking around I noticed that they started at the base of the deck, went to the sliding door and the window of the basement living room, then seemed to disappear off the side of the deck. I had my snow boots on so I walked around the yard but I could find no trace of footprints in the snow once they left the deck area. Keep in mind too that the daily temperatures that winter barely made it above zero Fahrenheit and the wind chill made it feel below 20 at least. Frostbite would have set in within a matter of maybe minutes for anyone walking around barefoot, especially in the dead of night like that. It was weird and I never experienced anything like that again, but I did adopt a second dog shortly thereafter to just keep an eye on things. So for some context for this story, my cats were separated with one in the attic with me and one downstairs with my family because they fought and my upstairs cat is now petrified of the other one even being on the same floor. But my siblings constantly left the attic door open and the downstairs cat would come up and start problems. My attic is set up though where on one side was the staircase leading into an open room then a short hallway, then the door to my room that took up the rest of the attic. But anyway, I was in my room, rule 7, and have a clear line of sight to where the attic stairs are in case someone came up. Then I see my downstairs cat run up and lay on the bed that we have in the other room. At this point, I'm annoyed because I'm always telling them not to let her up here, not to leave the door open either. So then my younger sister runs up with a look like, oh my goodness, they already saw that the cat came up. So I walk into the other room and start going off on her. Not yelling, but sternly telling her, I've already asked you to not to leave the door open and make sure the cat didn't come up. So now you have to grab her and take her downstairs because I'm not doing it again. And she starts whining. Come on, I'm afraid she's going to scratch me and she's not going to scratch you and even if she does, that's your problem. You wouldn't have to grab her if you just closed the door. She says, can't you grab her this time again and then if she comes up again, I'll do it. I say, no, I'm, I'm tired and I'm not doing it. At this point, I turn to my right to look at the cat on the bed, but she's not there anymore. I look in my room since my door is still open and my upstairs cat is sitting in the middle of the floor unbothered and watching us bicker. So I assume that the cat ran under the bed to avoid being dragged downstairs or something. I look at my sister again, point to the end of the bed and say, grab the cat. She says, come on, I don't want to get scratched, can you please do it? I'm getting more annoyed having to tell her over and over so I end up yelling at her, you need to grab the cat and take it downstairs right now because I'm not going to tell you again. Then, this little girl had the audacity to look me right in the eye and giggle, almost laughing at me, but fell by the foot of the bed and laid on the floor to look under the bed for the cat. Now, where she was was sort of out of my line of sight because it was a tall and wide bed so the mattress blocked her body almost entirely. I stood there waiting, watching my cat still just looking at me from my room and then I realized that she was taking way too long and didn't even sound like she was moving at all to try and reach for the cat. I turn back and say, hey Steph, come on this side and see if you can catch her here. She's probably by the wall. There's no answer, no movement, nothing. Steph, get up and check over here. You're not going to reach her if... And as I'm walking over, I notice that there's a green storage container exactly where my sister would have been laying down. In fact, my sister wasn't there at all. 
the downstairs cat wasn't there and my cat was still in my room just watching me. I slowly backed into my room and I locked the door and then I proceeded to shut myself in the room until I almost wet myself because I was too afraid that I'd see whatever spoke to me again. I eventually did go downstairs to use the bathroom and I asked my father and sister if any of them went upstairs at all today but they all said no. I have never ever hallucinated before or after this happened. I've also never experienced anything like it since and I know that I saw whatever it was. I heard it talk to me. In fact, it had an entire conversation with me and then it laughed right in my face. I used to participate in a group that did activities intended towards children. We usually went to neighborhoods to make games for the kids and so on and on Halloween we usually went to give candy to children while in costumes. That night I was dressed up as the Joker. So I went to the rally point and met the other guys and girls with whom we were going to give candy. We were about 30 or 40. The night went as planned, we did some games, then we handed out some candies and then we said goodbye. Three of my best friends were there and after the activities were over we sort of sat on a bench and talked about random stuff. Eventually we got to the topic of Halloween parties and how we never went to one. We really wanted to go to a Halloween party too, dance, drink, do teenager stuff. I'm kind of an introvert but I've always tried to live my life so when I'm old that I don't have to regret not doing stuff and partying was definitely one of them. So I too wanted to go to a Halloween party. We called our friends but nobody knew of any party around. Eventually we got in touch with our friend Lewis who was 18 at the time asking if he wanted to do something. He told us that he was going to round up a few people and then we could go out in 20 minutes. In those 20 minutes, we went to a friend's house. We cleaned up, changed clothes, and then Lewis called us back. He told us to go to a park nearby to get together. We went and we reunited with six of his friends. Four we knew and the other two we didn't, but they were nice enough. Thinking about what to do next because his house was now unavailable. We really didn't know what to do, so we ended up going to a skate park nearby to see one of them do some tricks and stuff with his kind of eccentric skateboarding, and we were all in awe, but after a few minutes we got tired down. After that we went to the cemetery to tell horror stories. Disrespectful, I know, but we were teenagers doing stupid teenager stuff. After that, Lewis said, do you guys want to go and drink? And we all said, yeah, let's drink, and... We went to a convenience store to buy some alcohol. I think I have to say that in Chile, people from 16 are expected, yet not legally allowed to drink, unless they're with an adult or something, and we were with people from 18 to 21 years old. But legally, adult age is 18 here, which is also the drinking age. But we had the alcohol, but we didn't have a place to go and drink it. So we went to a forest that was about 15 minutes outside of town, we couldn't really see much, so we had our phone flashlights on. When we got to a nice quiet spot, we lit up a fire. We made sure that there was no flammable material nearby, obviously. And in front of us was an open field. Behind us was a wall of bushes. And as the night went on, we spent hours listening to music, drinking, telling funny stories, laughing, playing tag at one point. It was a really good time. That is, until it wasn't. So before I continue, I think I have to explain what a flate is. In Chile, a flate is sort of like a gangster. They tend to form gangs and those who are in gangs tend to be really violent and short-tempered. They usually carry firearms or knives at least. This is a really vague description that I'm giving as not all of them are bad people and some are very friendly in fact, but it serves the story so I think that's all you really need to know. But anyway... After a while of dancing and drinking, we were kind of wasted, except for Lewis, his girlfriend, and her sister, all okay, which decided to remain sober in case something came up. We played hide-and-seek and tag, and it was really fun and a, a very good time, like I said. But then, while we were dancing, we heard something in the bushes. 
At first, we thought that it was an animal, like a rat or a bird, so we didn't think too much of it. We continued dancing around, and I remember seeing, clear as day, a stone suddenly coming at me a few centimeters away from my leg. I thought Lewis kicked it at first, and I told him, Dude, stop kicking rocks this way. He laughed it off and thought that I was drunk and joking, I think. And while I was kind of wasted, I definitely still had my senses about me. But then I saw another rock going in front of my eyes. It was like in slow motion this time, and I looked up, and I saw on Lewis's face a sheer expression of horror. I suddenly got scared as well. The only thing that he said to me was, run, and I was like, what? And he screamed at me, dude, run, someone's throwing rocks at us. I ran back to town, to the houses and the lights. Behind me, people were screaming, run and hurry. I ran as fast as I could. I was kind of drunk, like I said, and the terrain was really muddy, so it was difficult. It was also really dark, and I couldn't see really where I was going. All I knew was that I was running towards the lights. I ran until I reached the same spot where we came from in town, and then I waited. I was alone, and nobody came. I didn't know where my friends were, but after a while, a friend of mine showed up. He screamed at me, dude, give me your jacket or something. They hit Fred on the head. When they came closer to the light, I saw him helping the others walk. Upon seeing his face, blood was running down everywhere and dripping. I immediately gave him my jacket and called an ambulance. Then some of my other friends came, one by one. They all went to Lewis's place because it was nearby. Then Lewis came. Where's my girlfriend and my sister-in-law, he said. I told him that she didn't come through. We sent everyone to his house and waited for the two missing people. We were ready to go and face the people throwing rocks in case they were doing something to them, but then, thankfully, they appeared. His girlfriend was hysterically screaming. They hit my sister. They hit her. She's bleeding. We went to her and... The whole side of her face was just covered in blood. We rushed her to Lewis's house and made sure that we were all there. We were, and so we calmed down a bit, but when the ambulance came, the two who got hit went there with them, and we then called the cops. Now, I remember some of us being in shock, others were angry, and others were kind of in the middle ground. Lewis was raging, saying those stupid kids and so on and so forth. We didn't know who threw the rocks, obviously. I thought that we got into the terrain of somebody without knowing, and the owner tried to scare us away or something, but my friends told me that they saw a group of people hiding in the bushes. We left everything at the bonfire, the skateboards, the speaker, the wallets even. For me, I had everything safe, which I was grateful for, but for others, they obviously lost stuff. But Lewis then told me and my friends, dude, let's go find these guys. I was mad, but most of all, I wanted to try and retrieve some of the stuff that people had left there, so I told him that we should go, but if there were too many of them, then we should turn back. He called two of his friends, and in five minutes they were with us. I knew them because of some school stuff, but they were very loyal, and they both went to the gym and were pretty big fellas, so I felt safe when they came. Eventually, we went out to look for the people who threw the rocks, and when we were about a block away from the forest, we saw them, walking with our speakers, the skateboard, and other stuff that we left there. It was almost like a, a Mexican standoff. We were a block away from them, and we just sort of stared at each other. There were like 15 of them and only 6 of us, so in the end, we didn't really do anything and just turned back. But as we got a good look at them, they were clearly gangsters. So they probably had guns and knives, which was one of the reasons why we didn't confront them. But when we got back home, we actually ran into the police car and there were two of them. One got out of the car and we told them that we called and explained the situation pretty quickly because we didn't want the guys to run away. However, the officer told us, you're telling me that you're drinking, being minors, and then got attacked? We told him yes, and then he responded with the most upsetting stuff ever. So you minors were drinking, having a bonfire in the forest in the middle of the night, and now are asking me to give you justice? Don't you kids realize how hypocritical you guys are? 
I responded with, we were in supervision of three adults and not because we were drinking, we deserve rocks being thrown at our heads. He looked at me with an expression of just pure hatred. I was really scared but angry as well and he then repeated himself. We told him the guys were running away as we spoke with all of our stuff but he kept saying that it was our fault, that it was our problem that we were in that situation to begin with. After a few minutes though, the one inside the car told the other, hey, let's find the other people and then we can question these kids. And the other got inside. We waited at the house, but they never came back. And eventually we all just went to our respective homes and Lewis told us the next day that the policemen, they never returned. And so that was the end of the night. It was a really scary moment, but when I remember it, it kind of makes me smile in a way too because I have a good story to tell in moments like this. The two that got sent to the hospital, they did have to get some pretty serious stitches in their heads and were hospitalized for a couple of days because of how serious it was. But after a few days, we spoke of it like it was nothing, but we were really angry at the police to be honest. We even speculated about whether or not they were in on it or something because their behavior was really weird. But... If you got this far, then thanks for listening, and hopefully I don't ever have to experience anything like this ever again. I worked at a store that was very close to my house, so I walked home every day. The map of this story is, there's my job, my friend's job, a traffic light, a small park, another traffic light, three abandoned stores, and finally a gas station. The only busy part of this route is the gas station. Now, one day I was leaving work and it was starting to get dark. When I left, there was an employee fixing the electrical box of the store that my friend works at. I glanced at him, not thinking anything of it, and waved to my friend. She smiled through the glass door and I continued on my way. It was just a, another normal day. When I was exactly in the middle of the park though, I glanced quickly over my shoulder because I'm an anxious woman and saw the electrician who I just saw walking behind me. Everything I'm going to tell you now happened very quickly but when I looked back again, his eyes were fixed on me and he had no expression on his face. All the alarm bells were going off in my head so I started walking at a faster pace. More out of paranoia than real fear I guess but I looked again and this time more slowly and I noticed that his steps increased in speed just like mine. His expression had also changed to anger and impatience like a hunter frustrated because the little rabbit ran too fast. I think deep down our survival instincts know when someone wants to do something bad to us just by looking at them. I hadn't started running yet but the park which was actually small suddenly got much bigger. I don't know if when I looked back a third time my fearful expression gave me away but instead of walking he began to almost run and walk at the same time, his strides becoming so long that it was awkward to look at. And so I ran. I had seen this a thousand times on the news, the park was empty and it was just me and him and I knew what he wanted to do. I had my phone in my hand, but the adrenaline was telling me to keep running and running. I ran to the light and crossed the street, still not daring to look back. Maybe he was right behind me, and what would I do if he got to me? I thought after arriving at the abandoned stores that he would have given up, so I looked back one last time, and there he was, still not running though, just walking super fast in a really weird way. The adrenaline made me run even faster and when I looked again after a while, he had suddenly stopped. The guy just stood there, his angry expression also fading away. His face looked blank. It was like he was staring into nothing. But his eyes, his eyes were still fixed on me. At this point, I was already approaching the gas station and he was just a silhouette that didn't move. My heart was still racing and my hand was shaking so badly that I could barely type the password to my cell phone. I kept walking and looking back every second, but he didn't move an inch. I started to get paranoid thinking that maybe he really was an employee, that maybe I was imagining things, that he wasn't really following me. 
It's like our brain starts to justify the situation so you stop suffering or something, but when I was already at the end of the gas station and the adrenaline was slowly decreasing, my boss called me and asked if I had arrived home yet. I obviously said no and he said that my friend next door was worried about me because there was a, a crazy man pretending that he had tools in his hand and pretending that he was fixing the power box. She was too scared to tell him to stop and just watched his weird mimicking for a while, but when I passed by, he turned and followed me as if he was literally waiting for me. My friend was so scared that she tried to record the man in case something happened and was ready to call the police. And after that episode, I changed the route that I did for work and even started to use a bike too. I guess the moral of this story is... Don't forget to always stay alert of your surroundings. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't realized quickly enough that he was following me. He would have reached me in seconds, in fact. And I shudder at the thought of that. Two years ago, my mother and I were home alone for a few days because my father and my brother were traveling together. On a Friday, I got home from work at around 1pm. My mother came home at 5pm, opened my bedroom door and said hello. We had dinner together and then we each went to our individual rooms. Her room was next to mine. As it was Saturday, I slept in the afternoon and my mother had already left the house when I woke up. As soon as I opened the bedroom door, something on the floor caught my eye though. There were three scratches on the floor, one coming out of my room right in line with my door frame, and the other two going down the hall and heading towards my mother's room. They looked like scratches from shoes, I would guess, and I thought that it was strange because looking at the scratch coming from my room, the door had to be open enough to pass the threshold, and that had to have happened while I was sleeping, which also made no sense. But the order of the scratches didn't make sense either because it looked like the person had left my mother's room, gone down the hall and turned abruptly into my room, or the other way around. But the scratches were long, the kind that sports shoes would make, and the chances my mother had had those shoes on indoors were like zero. Shoes are banned indoors altogether. When my mother arrived while I was having lunch, I asked what those scratches on the hallway floor were. She turned irritated and questioned, What do you mean? What are they? You made it, didn't you? The burger that I was eating felt suddenly like sand in my mouth. I said no, that I thought that they were hers. We both got up at the same time and walked out into the hallway and stared at the scratches. And then she said something that really made me freak out. By the way, I didn't clean it because I'd already cleaned up the mud you brought into the house and... I got irritated and thought that I'd at least leave these here for you to clean up. I almost fell backwards. Mud? I asked. She gave me a nervous smile and said that there were small concentrations of mud in some places in the house, that she had found them in the morning on the porch, in the living room and in the hallway too. But I hadn't even been on the porch that day. A shiver instantly went through my whole body because... I knew that someone had entered our house, and the worst thing was that they had opened my door, my bedroom door, and had watched me sleeping. This happened probably five or six years ago now. I must have been 18 at the time. For starters, I lived in a city where neighborhoods and forests kind of blended together. There are plenty of wooded areas where people go to have bonfires and parties here and one night after discovering that all of our usual spots were crowded with people, I suggested that we go to a spot that I had been to a few times nearby. I'd been there multiple times but only ever during the day. The street where we park is maybe 200 feet from the tree line. It's your average middle class neighborhood, nothing crazy is really known to happen here but we walk in, start a bonfire, and we're all having a good time. Some of us are drinking and smoking a bit, myself included. About 45 minutes pass, and I'm a little bit intoxicated now, but nothing major. And over the sound of our quiet music and my friends talking, I suddenly hear something a bit odd. 
I can't make out what it is, so I figure maybe that I'm just hearing things. Maybe another ten minutes or so goes by too, and I hear it again. A little better this time, but it still sounds relatively far away, but it sort of sounds like Velcro tearing. I stop and just kind of sit there trying to listen while my friends carry away laughing and talking. They haven't seemed to have noticed yet, and that's when I heard a, a sound that I was very familiar with. A zapping noise, like you would hear from a taser. Very brief, but it was unmistakable, and upon hearing it, my stomach drops, and I started looking around a little frantically. My girlfriend at the time was first to notice my distress, and she asks me what's wrong, and I explain, and she immediately starts worrying. She gets my friends to quiet down a bit, and we all just sit there and listen for a bit. Then, we all hear it, an electrical zap, brief again, but we all know that sound. We all start panicking a bit, and we quickly put out the fire while asking each other what that was, or where exactly it was coming from. We're all obviously scared to walk out. It's only maybe a five minute walk to the street, but it's incredibly dark. We all muster the courage to finally walk the path out though, and we don't run into anyone, thankfully. We finally get to the street and start walking to our cars, nervously sort of laughing and relishing being under the street lamps again. But I see him first. He's walking towards us, not at us, just sort of walking in the direction that we just came from, slightly to the right of us, and he's holding a, a stick of some sort. It scared me at first, but for a brief second I calmed myself. It was a, a pretty safe neighborhood after all that I knew really well, and it was really common to see people out walking at night. But then I noticed that he's looking right at us, and that stare is burned into my mind. We pass each other. My friends and I are all silent now as we're having this stare down with this random person. And that's when it happened. He doesn't break eye contact, holds up the pole and smiles this creepy smile. His eyes are wide open. At the end of the stick lights up bright and that same zapping sound happens again, much louder this time. He was holding a cattle prod. We live in a city, no farmland nearby, no reason really to have one, so it was really strange. My friends and I are silently soiling ourselves as he walks past us, maybe 20 feet away and goes straight into the woods without a flashlight or anything. We all got into our cars and we just peeled out of there after that. And we obviously never went back to that spot ever again. So I'm not sure of the relevance of my background, but in any case, I am originally from rural northern Ontario, Canada, and have always spent most of my time in the woods or nature, regardless of where we moved. Over the years, I've seen some uh, weird stuff, but this experience, it definitely takes the cake. So when I was 16 years old, living with my mum in rural-ish New Jersey, USA, my best friend and I had an experience that we both still remember vividly, and my wife wants me to share this story too to see what other people think that we saw. So, my buddy and I used to cut through this farmer's field between my mum's neighbourhood and our local mall, maybe a mile or so long. It rarely had crops over the years, maybe one year a row of corn and a few years cutting through it, but... That's only if I remember it right. The field was barren on this day anyway and we were headed to the mall to hang out. We didn't notice anything unusual on the way to the mall through the field. We stayed in the mall about maybe an hour or two and we went back through the field to get back to my mum's. We didn't drink or eat anything in the mall that I remember. No drug usage or alcohol either. But when we got to the tree line between the field and the mall... We saw a handful of people, all dressed somewhat similar in overalls of some sort, played shirts, collecting things off of the ground. I figured that they were harmless, and we knew the old guy's name who owned the field, so probably wouldn't get yelled at if we name-dropped. As we made our way through the field and got closer, I remember feeling a lot of sort of static energy. It looked like they were picking up smoking coals off the ground, and 
throwing them in buckets or something? Weird, but we didn't say anything to these folks and just kind of skirted around them until we were nearing the tree line back to my mum's neighbourhood. We heard a, a loud whooshing noise, sort of like maybe an air compressor or something, but we turned back and there was a, a group of six identical white-suited men with sort of daft punk-esque helmets that seemed to be shooting silently like their weapons made no noise at the folks picking those things up off of the ground. Their sidearms looked like the guns used to spread weed killer or paint sprayer, really long and thin, but they didn't seem to notice us watching until my friend went into a panic and started freaking out. I grabbed him by his shirt and started dragging him toward the tree line, but he was in some sort of shock or something, and I looked back as we were running, and they were all facing us but not pursuing. My friend went home, and we didn't talk to each other for about a week, Everyone that we've told to date has said that we were mad, minus my wife and father. I will say, though, that after that initial whoosh, we never heard another noise, not even a cricket for the whole encounter. It was almost like sound was just gone all of a sudden, until we made it back across the tree line, that is. Anyway, I really don't know what to make of this. It was creepy for sure, and I'm curious to know what you guys think that we saw. My wife has always said that it was a glitch and other people have strange encounters and share them here so I thought, hey, why not? See what other people think. So my friends went to Mexico for a vacation and asked me to house it and take care of their dogs while they were gone. They pay me $40 a day just to, well, basically sit around and let the dogs out when they need to go. I am disabled though, so that helps a lot. This is a, a semi-rural area and houses are roughly a quarter mile apart. Police have to come from a town maybe 15 miles away and response time can be well over an hour. I always take my pistol with me because of this too. It's always been quiet when I've stayed there, but this time was definitely different. I was in the shower when the dogs started barking and growling. They are big, large German shepherds and one is actually police trained. The owners loan him to county as a, a drug dog and if you tell them to be quiet, they do obey. But this time, they didn't. So, obviously I was on high alert. I shut off the water and looked out the window. I didn't see anything, but when I walked out of the bathroom, I saw a shadow go across the bedroom window. They have lights around the house that stay on all night. I whispered to the dogs to hush and they did, and that's when I heard a man's voice. I couldn't make out everything that he was saying, but I distinctly heard two words, come around. So I'm sure that there was more than one person out there. I ran into the living room with my pistol and saw the door handle turn. I yelled, I have a gun and I'm willing to use it. And at that, I heard feet run away. I was telling Siri to dial 911 and got the county sheriff quickly. She said that there were two cars on another call not far away, but it took uh, maybe about 20 minutes for them to actually get there. Now, that's better than the usual hour, I admit, but I was pretty shaken. I explained that I was on a farm and would have to go down to the road and unlock a cattle gate to let them in, and to please tell the officers that I would be carrying a pistol and please don't shoot me by mistake because I was not going outside the house without it. The dispatcher said, don't go out there without your gun, I'll tell them. The one good thing about living in a red state. She asked though if I could see the road and I can, and she said to wait in the house until I saw blue lights. I hung up and I called my friends in Mexico. The camera footage can be downloaded via the app and they said that they would go through it while I waited for the cops. I locked the house and went down to the gate when the police arrived. They searched the whole place, including the barn, but they didn't find anything. While they were looking, my friends texted me the camera footage though and there was a man on the porch. Unfortunately, the cameras were sort of not angled to get the shot of his face and it was of course dark as well. But I still think that there was more than one creep because of what he said, come around. The police were very nice and said that they had passed a man on a bike on the way which was strange for this area, especially at night and went to look for him but 
That's all that they could really do. They did take a full report, but they never caught the creep. My husband came and stayed with me the rest of their trip, and one of their neighbors said that he actually found a tent and some gear in the woods a few weeks before. So somebody was actually living back there. Maybe a, a homeless person from the town? I have house sat again since then, and it was quiet this time. They're going away again for Christmas, and I'll be there again. A lot of people ask me if I would have shot the creep had he broken in, and yeah, absolutely. I would be sorry that I would have to have hurt somebody, but it's either them or me, so yeah, I would do it. So I'll start with some brief context. I had lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He got really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked, and we lived in a not-so-great part of town as well. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time, and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at Waffle House, and I was getting sick constantly, so keeping a job wasn't easy for me at that time. He liked drugs and alcohol, and he traumatized me in regards to both, blamed me for his usage, and would assault me while on it. Fun fact, too, is that he said that if I reported his conduct, he would blame me because he was the one on the substance. But anyway, I digress. When I finally got the courage to leave, for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mum to help me get my necessities, stuff with emotional value and some clothes. But instead, she called the cops and there was a warrant for his arrest and she got a police escort just in case. And as soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from different new numbers, threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter how much I blocked him, he just kept at it too. I was scared, but I thought for the most part that I was safe. After all, I was quite far away and he didn't have a car. But I was definitely wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up, he banged on the door and was screaming. His friend owning a gun is important too because he repeatedly said that he and his said friend would shoot us. My window was on the second floor facing the street and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled to my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window faced the backyard and I guess my monkey brain felt safer there for whatever reason but... I was the only one home and scared that if I breathed too loud, he would hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police because my dumb butt thought that he'd hear that too, but I silently texted my mum. Police arrived about 20 minutes after my mum said that they were on their way and he and his friend were taken into custody after that same friend had gotten him out on bond. His friend did have a gun too. He didn't. Bottom line was, I was able to get a restraining order finally, and strictly sober, and definitely in therapy after that. This has been going on for some time now, but tonight it was particularly weird. So, some context. I'm 25, female. And I live on the second story of my building across from a big city. We have lots of homeless people in my area and there's a safe uh, injection site right next to my home. I'll mention right off the bat too that I have been homeless within my lifetime as well from age 8 to 10 and grew up in the care of an addict. I completely empathize with folks who are having a tough go at things. However, I also value my safety and my neighbor's safety for that matter. So, I'll preemptively apologize if at any point I sound frustrated at this ongoing situation. I'm mad at the situation that has plagued both the life of myself and the homeless man who is tormenting my building. So, this all started about a year ago, when my partner and I were nearly attacked by this homeless man while downstairs in our parking lot. To summarize the situation, we had just gotten home where my partner was going to drop me off and... We didn't live together at the time, but we kind of do now, but only on the weekends. And as we said our good nights, we noticed a man pacing in the visitor's parking lot who was seemingly having a rough time. 
We kept our distance, car doors locked and windows up, and eventually the man got the hint and he left. Just to set the scene as well a bit here, my parking lot has two sections. One is a public or guest parking area. The second is a locked gate with a smaller locked door for residents to safely park overnight. The gate requires an FOB entry and the door has a regular building key. Both were made with metal bars and this is important for later. So I got out of the car and proceeded to walk towards the door, key in hand. My partner started up the car which caused the homeless man to rush back into the park gate and promptly attack the car. He hopped onto the hood, beating at the windows and trying to rip off the mirrors. I watched in horror as this terrifying situation evolved next to me, a mere 14 feet away I would guess, but I quickly got my key into the lock and opened the door at lightning speed. The sound of my keys caught the attention of the man and he promptly sprinted towards me. Thankfully, by this point, I had begun closing the door behind me. By the time that he got to me, I slammed the door in his face and I stepped backwards while he just screamed at me. When my partner realized that I was safely behind a locked door, he got into gear and drove away. Moments later, he called me and instructed me to get away from the door and safety upstairs. It was a good thing that he did that too because I felt like I was just completely frozen. I couldn't move. My heart was pounding out of my chest as this homeless man screamed disgusting things at me, most of which revolved around sexually assaulting me and gesturing crudely at his groin and flicking his tongue and I finally broke my freeze, walked away as he chanted, pretty lady, pretty lady, want a taste, huh? Those words are burned into my memory now too, but I rushed upstairs and quickly closed the blinds of my windows. I heard him still yelling and chanting outside for a good few minutes after, but then I heard something really unusual. A sort of lighter clicking. The silence was deafening as the lighter clicked repeatedly. Eventually the click stopped and he began laughing. I looked outside, peering through the blinds. I realized that he was attempting to set our building's wooden fence on fire. Luckily, it had been raining, so the fence wasn't catching, but I quickly hopped on a call with the emergency services who sent a police car and a fire truck. As soon as the cop car pulled up, the homeless man went absolutely ballistic and started screaming at the top of his lungs. They apprehended him quickly and took him away in the ambulance. Months passed with no sign of him, but one day a resident in my building reported being attacked by a man who matched his description. After that incident, we, the residents, repeatedly heard him screaming, crying, moaning, and even laughing at least three times a week outside of our building, generally at night. He also started trashing and damaging people's cars when they parked in the guest parking lot. Thankfully, we installed a new gate last week that closes off the guest parking behind another FOB activated gate. But the thing is, is as soon as the gate got installed, the man left us alone. It's been a really quiet week, and it's been nice. But tonight, about an hour ago, I was laying in bed scrolling on TikTok when I heard what sounded like soft sobbing. At first, I thought it was coming from TikTok, but after some scrolling, I realized that it was coming from outside. I looked outside, and there he was, sobbing and pacing around in the back alley. He suddenly switched gears though and started jogging while groaning loudly and continuing to cry while occasionally hitting and attacking the new fence that we installed. He's seemingly left now, but honestly, I'm terrified at this new habit. I'm really hoping that he doesn't start crying outside of my building routinely. It's terrible to listen to and I feel really bad for the guy. And I also feel bad sharing this, but the whole situation is really freaking me out and... I just don't feel safe in my own home anymore. I think I just need to vent, but I also am wondering if uh, you guys have any ideas of what I should do about this. So my grandparents live in a house located in a, a very secluded area surrounded by woods. The nearest neighbor is around maybe half a mile from their house. Whenever my grandfather has work in town for a couple of days, he calls me home to take care of my grandmother, who suffers from arthritis. 
Now one night, it started raining really heavily, and there was a power cut the entire night too. It was really windy, and since the house is pretty old, you can hear a lot of creaking sounds. But at around one, in the middle of the night, I woke up to a loud knocking sound at the front door. My grandmother was still sleeping, and I didn't want to wake her up. The noise had freaked me out because it was impossible for someone to be out at this time in the rain outside of our house like that. But I thought maybe it was my grandfather, who probably had some emergency and had to come home at this time of night. As I walked to the main door to see who it was, the knocking suddenly stopped. I saw our dog standing at the corner of the room, looking at the door with his tail between his legs. He looked really scared. I figured something wasn't right and that if someone was outside of my door, it obviously wasn't my grandfather. So I went upstairs to see who it was through the window and what I saw was a shadow. But I'm not sure if it was actually a, a person's shadow or just a hallucination of my sleepy mind. Whatever the case, I didn't open the door and in the end I just went back to bed and I fell asleep. But the creepiest part was that the next morning I saw muddy footprints on my front porch and also a broken door handle like it had been completely ripped off. This happened back in the 80s. My best friend and I were wandering around the neighborhood in the afternoon and we came to a short bridge at one point that went over a small creek and we looked over the rail, saw this kid crouched on a big flat stone at the edge of the creek, poking around in the water with a stick. He was wearing a red hoodie with the hood up, blue jeans and white high top sneakers. I couldn't help but notice though just how incredibly clean his clothes and shoes looked. Well, we thought it would be funny to drop a rock in the water and sort of splash him, seeing that he didn't seem to know that we were there yet. Then, all of a sudden, he just sort of seemed to look up at us. Didn't stand up or anything, just calmly turned his head and looked right at us. But the weirdest thing is that his face was pure white and perfectly smooth, like an egg or something. No features at all, and... The fear that we felt at his gaze was instant and intense. We ran like we've never run before about two blocks and after that day, we never really talked about it again. About a year later though, I was hanging out with some other guys riding bikes and another friend came running up out of breath and freaked out. Started describing the exact same sort of faceless kid doing the exact same thing but at a different spot along the river. I just kind of froze over, but everybody else was making fun of him. I looked at him and just asked, super clean looking? He just went silent. I often wonder if anyone else has seen this kid or this thing, whatever it is. When I was 11, I'm now 40. I moved in with my best friend Charlotte and her family. My family and I were really not getting on, so Charlotte's mum, Mercy, let me live with them for a few months. I stayed in Charlotte's room and the two of us would get up every day, make our lunches and head off to school. We lived in the nicer part of a poor neighborhood. Mercy worked full time and Charlotte's dad wasn't on the scene. Charlotte's brother Dallas was two years older than us and the self-proclaimed man of the house he had a whole stack of friends whose home situations were similar to mine, so it wasn't uncommon for the house to be full of teenagers by the time Mercy got home. Dallas's girlfriend lived next door. I never met her, but I remember that there was always people coming and going from her house. It was around this time, too, that Dallas lost his front door keys, and we'd started noticing that food was going missing, too, and that things would not be where we thought that we had put them. One day Charlotte and I came home from school and we headed to our room to drop our school bags off and we noticed that we each had an envelope on our pillows. At first both of us thought that Dallas had decided to write us notes about how we thought that we were ugly or smelly or something, harmless big brother type teasing. My envelope had a drawing on the front that I didn't understand. 
I remember opening it and finding a letter inside, though. Charlotte passed me her letter, and though the handwriting was messy, the letter told her how pretty she was. We both knew that there was no way that these letters were from Dallas. That said, I didn't want to give her mine. The author of mine detailed how they were going to come into the house and, well, kill me and sexually assault me. And to ensure, I understand that I realized that the strange picture on the front of my envelope was a crude drawing of a person getting, well, you can imagine. Terrified, we called Mercy and told her what had happened, and she in turn called the police. When Dallas came home from school, we took the letters to show him and explained how we found them. He came up to our room to look around and examine our beds and belongings, Dallas called all of his friends over and interrogated them in his mum's room with the door closed. Once he was satisfied that it was none of them, he showed them the letters to see if they recognized anything familiar about them. Then they went out to ask the neighbors if they'd seen or heard anything. They never found out exactly who left the envelopes, and the police said that there was really nothing that they could do. I don't think Charlotte and I slept much for a week or so after that too. And when some of Charlotte's and Dallas's clothes showed up on the washing line at his girlfriend's house, we figured that he must have lost his keys while visiting her, and that someone there had been coming over during the day to eat our food and steal our stuff. We changed all the locks in the house, and thankfully after that, nothing else happened. But I was really scared and angry for some time. Every time people went over to her house, I wondered if it had been them if they were the ones who snuck into Charlotte's room and delivered those foul letters to us. I was really happy when that family finally moved away. I grew up in the 90s in Minnesota. My parents divorced when I was eight and we spent every other weekend at my dad's haunted house. This house had every type of ghost or spirit, whatever you want to call them, you could think of. A shadow man in a trench coat and a brimmed hat, another separate shadow figure that danced down the hallway, a man dressed to go fishing, a doppelganger of my father, two giggling little girls, and many other unseen things too. The dishwasher, radios, and lights would turn themselves on and off randomly, Loud banging would be heard on walls and doors, door handles would jiggle and turn on their own, feelings of being sort of touched or caressed in the shower were reported frequently. My father also had an incident where he felt someone crawl into bed with him in the middle of the night when he was the only one home. On my uncle, he reported hearing two little girls giggling and singing in the basement one night while sleeping downstairs. Upon awakening the next morning, he discovered that there were no kids in the house that night. So, who did he hear playing in the middle of the night like that? Also, there was a, a salamander plague one night too. The entire yard was covered in slimy, slithering salamanders. It only ever happened once, and I'm not positive if that was paranormal, but it was definitely strange, as you can imagine. But one sunny Saturday morning, while visiting my dad, my brother and I were up early watching cartoons. I was eight years old, and my brother was three. As we sat on the couch, we heard three alerting knocking sounds on the wall five to six feet behind us. Our heads sort of quickly snapped back to look at the wall where the sound was coming from, but we didn't see anything. My brother and I quickly turned to look at each other with frightened eyes, I being the older sister trying to be brave. I told him that it was nothing. As we turn our attention back to the cartoons, my little eight-year-old brain is spinning I mean, what if that banging noise that we just heard wasn't just the pipes, as I'd been told so many times before? What if it was a ghost? I hated when the ghosts came around like that too. Why isn't my dad around whenever this happens? As these thoughts swirl in my head, we hear it again. This time, it's coming from somewhere in the kitchen off to our left. It's not as loud as the first time, and the sound is different like someone is knocking on the kitchen counter this time instead of the wall. We quickly strain our necks to peek inside the kitchen with lightning speed to catch whoever or whatever is making that noise, but again, there's nothing there. I take a deep breath. Once again, I pretend to be brave and tell my brother it's nothing, just ignore it. 
My heart is thumping in my chest, mind you, and there are butterflies in my tummy as the familiar anxiety grows worse with each passing second. But I tuck myself up on the couch in a ball, not wanting my legs to dangle off the side. I suddenly no longer feel safe. Nothing is to be trusted. Again, the same sound. This time the sound is coming from the dining room. I can also tell this time that the noise is coming from the wooden dining table. I can see the entire table from where I'm sitting and there is nothing on the table that should be making that noise. No one except me and my brother are awake and there is no one in the dining room. But there's just no logical reason for this knocking noise that is moving around us like this. But just then, I realize the knocking sounds have been moving in a, a big circle around us. If this invisible thing is to move any closer to us... The next logical place for it would be in the living room where me and my brother are currently sitting. The knock would be on the coffee table sitting less than uh, maybe a foot away. And no sooner than that thought crossed my mind, it happened again. This time, the noise came from the coffee table sitting less than a foot away from us. I instantly flip over the back of my couch in a reverse somersault like motion and run at superhuman speed to my father's bedroom. In my panic I completely left my little three year old brother behind to fend for himself. Luckily he wasn't too far behind though. Luckily he wasn't too far behind but we sneak into our father's room and quietly lay on the floor. Our dad would have been super ticked off if we woke him up early on a Saturday morning even for a ghost. In our commotion though, we wake up our six-year-old sister who is sleeping on our dad's floor. Us three kids always slept on this floor together when we were visiting. We also used the bathroom together. That's how terrified we were of ghosts here, but we quietly whisper what just happened out in the living room to our sister. And as we're telling her this story, something catches our eye. We can see a, a black shadow under the small space between the bottom of the door and the plush carpet. This black shadow is slowly pacing back and forth in the hallway, just on the other side of the bedroom door. Back and forth, back and forth it went, like this shadow was, I don't know, almost waiting for us. Unfortunately, I don't really remember what happened after this. Somehow the rest of that memory has been lost with time, I guess, but I don't know for sure if we didn't open the door or not. All I remember is that later in the day, I was playing with my siblings, and that's it. So this happened a long time ago, but it still creeps me out. This happened back in 2017. I worked nights and was getting my work out in before I had to go to work that night. My wife and daughter are in the living room, and... My wife hears someone try to walk into our apartment. Understandably panicked, she quickly gets my attention in the other room. I go to look through my peephole and immediately think that it's my little brother, but when I open the door, I realize that it was a complete stranger. He had shaggy hair, his eyes were huge, like dilated, like he was on something, and he was wearing a black hoodie with the hood up. He had his hands inside his pockets on the hoodie and it looked almost as if he was clutching something pretty tightly. My gut instinct is strong at this point and I quickly try to shut the door. As this happens, he tries to insert his foot so that I can't. Luckily, I was quicker and was able to get the door shut and locked. I then booked it to my room and got my gun, still unsure of what this guy had in mind. But by the time that I got back, he was nowhere to be found around my apartment. I keep thinking that he just had the wrong apartment and maybe he mistook it for somebody else's but then I remembered that he tried to stop me from shutting my door combined with how quickly he got out of there and whatever he was clutching in his pocket like that. To this day, the thought of what could have happened, it still terrifies me and although it does go without saying, I did end up calling in that night. My family and I are from Australia and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday in America. We traveled from LA up the west coast and then back down through Nevada. 
We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation road trip style. But one night, we were traveling towards Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around a while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't too, well, bring your own UV light, if you know what I mean. And my mum and dad found a place that looked okay and went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night, while my sister and I stayed in the car and listened to music on our iPods. We were bopping along to the Frey album I had bought that day when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mum, what is she doing? I looked up out the window and can see in the reception of the motel and see my dad talking to the manager and my mum displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with staff everywhere so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I said to my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mum was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looked around the place as if she was on guard for something, as if her hypervigilance sensors had kicked in or something. After some time though, my mum and dad got back into the car and they discussed what to do about staying the night. My dad stated that he wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we better just stay here. Plus it was the last room available so we would have to make a quick decision anyway. To his dismay, my mum disagreed though. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, said my mum. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mum couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place until my mum finally snaps and yells over my dad saying, We're not staying here. Ah, fine, my dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point... My sister and I are sort of looking at each other like, what the heck just happened? But we stay quiet as mum seems on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that mum approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we're all bustling around the motel room getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV and there's a news story about a shooting at the motel that my mum didn't want to stay at that night. Turns out... About 15 minutes after we left, that's right, only 15 minutes, a couple walked in and booked that last room, and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all instantly turned to look at my mum, who was standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror, and she says, I told you I had a bad feeling about that place. She said it to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. Moral of this story is always trust your gut, or better yet, maybe always trust your mum's gut. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in New South Wales. We would go there every school holidays and there were many kids that I used to run around and play with there. I have fond memories of this place too where I learned to ride a bike and even had my first kiss. But other memories are not so good, and now leave me with that sort of egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people that owned the caravan park had a son, and he was roughly 25 years old. I would have been around 5 or 6 at the time, I guess, but he would drive around the park and collect everybody's rubbish on a tractor, and do other odd jobs like this to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he would pull up when I was playing at the front and ask if I wanted a ride on the tractor. I, being young and naive, of course accepted and jumped on because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor, right? This was back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision and you just came back home and the streetlights came on. But one day, when he dropped me back to our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by my arm and yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me to never, ever hang out with him again. I don't want you hanging around with that man again, he said without saying why. But he's nice. He gives me lollies, I say. Just don't. I'm telling you, don't talk to him, he replied. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me to talk to the nice man who only gave me tractor rides, gave me lollies and hugs and sometimes the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, my dad said that I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore, to which he smirked and replied, oh yeah, why's that? Anyway, 
Fast forward nearly 13 to 14 years later, my family and I are watching the news when that man's face flashes across the screen, attached to a story where he had apparently murdered two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, look at this, look at this. I knew he was bad news. There was always just something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on that tractor? My blood instantly ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part, he killed people with pills that he would call his lollies. Please, always listen to your parents. I mean, I would be dead by now if it wasn't for them. So this is a bizarre experience that I've been confused about for some time and I wanted to share it. And I also wondered if anyone could shed some light on what might have been going on here. So in September of 2018, I, a 23 year old female, was visiting San Francisco and was walking through Fisherman's Wharf. It was super busy, there were a lot of people and I was just passing the entrance to Pier 39 when... A man dressed entirely in black stepped out a few feet ahead and started walking directly towards me. I didn't think much of it at first until another man appeared out of nowhere to the side of him and both seemed about to corner me. A really weird thing was that both men were wearing latex gloves too. They looked out of place but obviously I was like what the heck and turned around and walked straight off in the opposite direction. It was weird, but I didn't give it much more thought. Fast forward a week later, I'd returned to San Francisco from a trip and was once again around Pier 39 with a couple of girls that I had met out there, and at this particular moment, we had just spotted another couple of people from our group. It's difficult to explain, but at the exact moment we greeted the other guys we knew, another person appeared directly beside me, wrapped an arm around my friend and I and said, hey, let's get a selfie, while snapping a picture of us on his phone. I noticed the phone was angled so that only my friend and I were in the photo, not him, which was weird. But I quickly covered my face, but they got a complete picture of my friend's face. When I turned around to look at the person, it was one of the guys who had tried to stop me a week earlier, again dressed in all black. To be honest, I was completely freaked out by this experience and after we'd got some dinner in the area, I told my friends that we'd have to get an Uber back to the hostel rather than walking, even though it was a short distance, because I just had a really bad feeling about that encounter. I wanted to call the police, actually, but no one else seemed to understand why I was so concerned. To this day, I, I do wonder, did we narrowly avoid being trafficked or something? I can't think of what else would have been going on, but thankfully, in the end, nothing else really came of it. It was such an odd and weird experience that I just can't stop thinking about it, though. So I live with my dog and my roommate in a one-story duplex. I've got a fenced-in yard and the private spot where my car parked is accessible via an alleyway with a bunch of massive signs saying no parking, no trespassing, private property and whatnot. So I was sitting in my bedroom playing games and it was around 12 or 1 in the morning and my dog sitting on the couch in the living room started barking at something outside. Every now and then she does this because there's a squirrel or a bush moved or something. So I get up to go and shush her and I open the blinds on the window to say, see, there's nothing outside. But actually, there is something outside. Through the fence I can see the headlights of a car idling out in the front of my house and lights sort of bobbing around outside. And what appears to be people walking around in front of my yard by my car with flashlights looking around. In the middle of the night, mind you. Full disclosure, I was also kind of stoned. And I'm not sure if it's a reverse effect because my sober self is an anxiety-ridden creature living under a blanket who was too scared to send an email to my manager. But my high self is Fred from Scooby-Doo pretty much, as in, come on gang, let's solve the mystery. So I decide that I'll just go out there and investigate. 
I let my dog out with my pajama wearing unarmed braless self out there. My yard is fenced so my dog cannot go to them without me opening the gate. But she does keep barking and step outside and I go to the gate. I can now see it's a well-dressed woman and a man in a sort of nicer newer model car. They're walking around the front yard with flashlights and I go, Hey, this is private property. Can you please leave? The woman seems kind of startled and says, Oh, uh, sorry, our car broke down. The man gets in the car and she walks around, goes back in the car. They talk for a while. I'm really not sure what else to do at this point, so I just kind of stand there watching for what felt like ages, but maybe it was only a, a minute or two. I don't know how long it actually was, but they seem to be deciding what to do and he starts the car back up. They pull out, proceed to drive around, pull into the public street and park behind my neighbor's car instead. I decide to sit outside from my porch and kind of watch them to make sure that they didn't get out and start investigating the neighbor's car instead. And they never popped the hood of their car, mind you, or got out, which seemed to run fine when they drove off, by the way. I never saw them come back either. A couple of notes here too is that there are loads of spots you can park in and around my neighborhood that would not be on clearly private property with better lighting and you do not need to be near other cars there too. But to get to where my car is parked, you've got to drive down an alleyway and look for a spot like my friends have trouble finding it. The car was like a newer model sports car, mind you. Not saying that those can't ever break down, but I guess that I'd be less suspect if they just rolled up in a, I don't know, like a Geo Metro Mini Cooper or an old Subaru hatchback or something, and were like, oh man, my terrible car broke down. When I sobered up the next day, though, I was like, I either just politely told some car thieves to stop attempting robbery on me, and they did, or I made someone's terrible night even worse. I mean, they didn't seem to be dressed for stealing a car, more like a party or a date night. The woman was in heels, for instance, and I really don't know much about cars, so maybe they really did just break down and the spot next to my car was the closest they could find or something. But then I maybe spooked them even more by taking neighborhood watch a little too far and I guess if I parked in a neighborhood and a, a half-naked woman and a possibly big scary dog came outside to stare at me in the middle of the night, I'd probably get out of there too. But I don't know, something about the whole situation just didn't sit well with me. I mean, why did they have torches out like that and what were they looking for? It just seems really strange and doesn't seem to match up with anything that I can come up with. So I'm having some very strange things happening to me lately that are really starting to legitimately scare me now. I live on a farm in the middle of SC USA and I'm a cigarette smoker so I go outside at random times at night and I usually am okay with it, just usual sounds, but every once in a while I'll hear something like strange noises but just sort of brush it off. But lately, within the past month, it's gotten a heck of a lot worse. For instance, I'll be sitting on the porch and I can hear voices of people talking, which sound very close, which is obviously unnerving to say the least. But last night, it was way worse. The voices started sounding like people I know, which they don't live anywhere near me. They live in other parts of the country or in different countries altogether. And well... The other night it sounded like someone was approaching me from my right and it kept getting closer until I stood up and I pulled my pocket knife out and went to the stairs on the porch and as I did that, whatever it was, ran. It sounded like two feet running off into the woods. Last night though, it got super close whatever it was, like at the end of the porch and I also heard breathing. It was terrifying so... I just instantly went inside. I got curious at this point though and video chatted my girlfriend. I went back out and we were listening together and I swear that I heard something that I've never heard around here at all. 
I heard a little kid singing, which eventually turned into an adult laughing, and then like two minutes of wailing that moved slowly through the woods, just out of sight, so I couldn't see who it was. She didn't hear it, which well, obviously she's on a video chat, so maybe she just didn't hear it, or I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm going mad or something. I don't know if I'm being messed with by people or something more serious, or if it's just my own mental health. If anyone has any ideas of what this is, then please let me know because I'm almost at the point of just getting in my car and leaving and never coming back. Also, I forgot to add too that there's a cemetery at the end of our yard which I believe has two children and two adults judging by the size of the tombstones. Whoever they are, those tombstones are really old and I don't know if that means anything or if, like I said, perhaps I'm just losing it. So I, a 25-year-old female, have always remembered these experiences from my childhood as the most confusing and scary times growing up. My brother is three years younger than me and this all started happening when he was around four or five. We can call my brother B and B as a child had health problems and needed a lot of different surgeries that he was in and out of hospital often with. The way my mum will retell this is that this all started with my brother having a horrendous night terrors, so bad that he would sit upright in bed with a blood-curdling scream, thrashing his arms and legs around. When B would wake up, he would have no recollection of his dream, but as time went on, B started to talk to someone at night and his toy fire trucks would start to light up with the siren going off too. My mum would wake up in the morning and the clocks would all be set to 2.15am, which was really weird. In our house too, we had a storage room under the stairs. The storage room was right next to B and I's playroom. B would always say that John and his mum lived in that storage room and he would go and knock on the door and say, Hi John's mum, can John come and play with me and my sister? I never really thought too much of it being a child and my parents telling B that he had an imaginary friend. B would want us to set up an extra plate for John at the dinner table, buckle him into the car, etc. And would freak out completely if my parents didn't comply. We had weird things going on in the house though too. My baby dolls would go off non-stop to the point that my mum took the batteries out and shoved the dolls in the bottom of the toy box. And one in specific still went off, even without batteries, which I didn't even know how that's possible. But we also had this motion sensor, a big bird plushie, that constantly went off when nobody was in the room, and the toy would be turned off all the time too. This went on for at least a year, I think, and my mum has said that the breaking point was my brother crying in the kitchen, saying him and John apparently got into a fight with B saying, I told John that we can't be friends anymore because I have bones and he doesn't. That same night too, I woke up to a woman calling my name and standing at the side of my bed. When I rolled over and opened my eyes, she immediately asked me, where's John? I didn't reply and she seemed to get upset and asked again, where's John? I again didn't reply and was so scared that I just rolled over and closed my eyes, hoping that it would go away. When I rolled back over, she was gone. I remember I booked it into my parents' room. My mum let me sleep in their bed for the night, but the next night, I remember my mum talking to a priest and another strange man. My mum has since told me that the priest was there to bless the house and the other man was a medium to help John and his mum cross over. The medium was able to tell my mum that John and his mum had passed away in a house fire, which has always messed with me because the main toy that went off was Beast fire truck, remember? I mean, it was set off almost every night. Was John trying to tell us something? But apparently he had attached himself to B the last time he had surgery. After the blessing and the encounter with the medium, John and his mum were never encountered again, not even by my brother. I really don't know what to make of most of it, but all I can say is that if John and his mum were not just imaginary, then... I do hope that they found their way to the light.
So basically, I was raised very Christian, strict Christian, and have never really believed in ghosts, but I do believe in demonic entities or something that is definitely evil. Now that I'm older, I'm still on the fence about believing in ghosts, as in things that are spirits of dead people roaming about that have no ill intent. Even with this belief though, I still loved a good horror movie, and admitted that a lot of other people's encounters were hard to explain if the paranormal entity in question seemed harmless. It's important to remember this part too, because it's a part of the story. So when I was in high school, I was best friends with a girl who was a little bit weird, and she was the definition of pretty much a pick-me girl. Her name was Amanda, and I would stay at Amanda's house basically every weekend, and after we graduated, I was there pretty much 24-7. Never once did I feel weird in her house or anything, but one day, Amanda calls me basically in tears, insisting that someone has broken into her house and that she hears footsteps and banging, and I told her that I would come over and check it out because I live literally like two minutes down the road from her. I show up and the doors are all locked. I, being an idiot, jokingly start kicking on the doors, yelling out, calling for any serial killers to come out. It made her laugh and feel better, and to be honest, it kind of made me feel better too. Weeks passed though, and we forgot about the situation, and we just go on with our lives. When suddenly, Amanda is telling me how her dad finally fixed the upstairs bathroom shower where her bedroom is, and that every time that she uses the shower, she feels like she's being watched, and the lights flicker, and it really creeps her out. I play it off as her just being spooked or trying to creep me out or something. But then another time, her mum is talking to me and tells me that she got spooked because the door to that bathroom got stuck and she said that it felt like someone was holding it shut. Again, I play it off as just something that can be scientifically explained. Their house was split level and her parents basically had the entire downstairs and their kids had the upper level. But there were two rooms that suddenly started bothering me and it was the upper living room and the laundry room downstairs. Every time that I'd go upstairs I would swear that I saw a black figure in the corner of my eye and every time that I would go into the laundry room it was eerily dark even with the lights on and freezing cold even in the middle of summer. It was weird but in the end I just sort of avoided those areas and I had read something about how the sound vibrations can cause people to think that they see something that's not really there or something along those lines. Point is is that it made me feel better and the laundry room I figured was just because it had concrete flooring so it was cooler. But one night I had come over late after work and Amanda went downstairs to take a shower. I had laid down on her bed with her door open and my back turned and I just got this awful feeling of being watched all of a sudden. You know how sometimes you can almost hear when someone is sneaking up on you? Well, I had that feeling. I immediately sat up and looked at the doorway, convinced that it was her brother messing with me or the dog had come upstairs or something, but when I did, there was nothing there. But I just could not shake that feeling though. It felt like someone was literally walking in through the doorway and staring holes into me. And at any second, something scary was about to happen. I sat there for probably two minutes just staring, debating if I should book it, pray, or scream. It felt like forever, but I finally heard Amanda coming out of the bathroom, and immediately, that feeling just faded. I told Amanda straight away about this, and... When she hears it, she kind of brushes it off and says that it's her grandpa's ghost and he likes to mess with people in the house apparently. I remind her of all the horrible things that had been happening lately and she tells me that her mum had bought some sage or something and was going to sage the house to get rid of it, but had a dream where her dad came to her and said that it was him just playing and decided that she wouldn't sage it after all. I'm obviously pretty creeped out at this point, but decided that it's too late for me to drive home and just decide to sleep in bed with her. But that night, I have absolutely the worst nightmares I've ever had. Like being chased in the dark, weird voices saying stuff that I don't understand, something wanting to kill me type nightmare. I wake up, tell myself that I'm just freaking out, but from that day on, 
I just kept getting them, and they got worse too. It wouldn't be every night, but it was often enough to bother me. One night I was sleeping at my boyfriend's house and had a sleep paralysis type nightmare too, where something opened his bedroom door and crawled in on the ceiling. A picture alien, but with a human head and long talons. I woke up halfway through, unable to move, and kept trying to call out for my boyfriend, but instead fell back asleep and the dream picked up right where it left off. I text Amanda's mum and she reaffirms that there's nothing evil in her house. It's her dad and he was just playing pranks on all of them. A few more weeks passed though and I stopped going to Amanda's house because one, well, the demons. And two, Amanda starts acting really shady too. She's doing things that I don't like, such as sleeping over at my ex's house, sending me snapchats of them together, constantly talking of him and just being a jerk. She also somehow figures out my new boyfriend's Twitch account and is constantly watching him stream, trying to get him to talk to her, asking for his Snapchat, number, Insta, etc. And at that point, I just sort of lose my mind about it and I cut all ties from her. And, coincidentally, or maybe not, I don't know, but the nightmares instantly stop. I don't know what to think about that, but... I would like to know if I wasn't just having some kind of psychotic snap and it was at a bad point in my life for sure but the fact that her family knew about it and thought that it was a dead relative just, I don't know, it makes my skin crawl. So I'm not a big believer in ghosts but I have had two experiences that have kind of shifted my perspective I guess you could say. One of them was when I lived in Bellingham, WA. My wife and I moved into a house at the end of Virginia Street back in 2016. The house was in decent condition, but certainly older. We had a daughter who was about five or six at the time and a newborn. And after moving in, we noticed a, a few strange things happening. We never felt threatened by whatever was in that house. And I fully admit that maybe all of these are just some random events brought together by coincidence. But after moving in, my wife wanted to finally get cable TV. Having worked with Comcast before, I have always seen cable as a bit of a waste of money. And I certainly wasn't making a lot too. But she wanted it, so we ended up getting it. A day or two later, I was asleep and having a dream that the TV was really loud in the other room. My wife woke me up and said that somebody was in the house and that they had turned on the TV. So it wasn't a dream. I told her to stay put in the room with the baby and the phone to call the police if she heard a commotion and I got my pistol, military, LE type background and I carefully moved towards the living room. It was hard to hear if someone was moving around because the TV was so loud, pretty much full volume but I tried to pay attention anyway because I knew that I needed to have positive identification before raising the pistol and the house was dark. After all, waving a gun at shadows is how innocent people get shot. I got to the living room though and didn't find anything so I kept moving. I didn't turn off the TV because I figured the loud noise would also mask the sound of my movements. Since it was my house I figured that I had the home court advantage against my intruder. I was very lucid given that I had just been dead asleep but adrenaline is like that. I ultimately cleared the entire house and in the end I didn't find anything. The TV had apparently just come on by itself. Stuff happens, I figured, as I turned off the TV and stood in complete silence. Wires get crossed and the old man across the street may have turned in his TV and the same remote frequency may have activated our TV. Who knows? I secured my pistol, you have to with kids in the house, and tried to go back to sleep. But a few days later, I picked up my daughter at school. Dad, I have to tell you something. Great, I thought. My daughter got put in time out again at school for being disruptive. She's always been a bit of a, a lovable blabbermouth, but... Uh, what happened? Well, last night my TV came on by itself. Now, I might have normally brushed this off with the same crossed wires, TV remote sort of logic gymnastics, but my daughter's TV was only connected to a PS3, which we used so that she could watch Netflix. It takes two separate remotes to turn anything on as well, so this was definitely a bit creepy. 
Because my security contracting job had me work all over at different times of the day, my wife and I would frequently sleep in different rooms so I didn't wake her up when I went to work. As a nursing mother, she was already getting very little sleep as it was. And after I went to bed one night, I heard running up and down the hallway, just like quick little steps running past my door. I even got up and opened the door to tell my daughter to stop running. And almost simultaneously, my wife opened her door, opposite mine across the hallway, to tell our daughter the same thing. Are you making all that noise? No, I said. I thought it was Isa. But I could see in our daughter's room, and she was asleep in her bed. She's asleep, though. And she was. Not in the way kids pretend to be asleep so that they don't get yelled at, too, to go to bed. This was the sleep with drool coming out of her mouth and her hair covering her face, just like completely out of it. My wife and I didn't talk about the footsteps that we had both heard running down the hallway, but a few days later, I was in bed again in the spare bedroom, almost asleep, and I heard this terrible noise of what could only be the unmistakable sound of a plastic sippy cup falling onto the linoleum in the kitchen and bouncing around for what seemed like forever. I've got her this time, I thought tossing the blankets off so that I could tell our daughter to go back to bed. I grumpily walked to the kitchen and flicked on the light, but when I did, there was nothing. No cup, no explanation for the sound whatsoever. My wife followed. Hey, what was that noise? Uh, nothing, I said. I didn't need to freak her out. We both became more aware of a presence in that house. Not evil, I don't think, but... Just annoying, like they were starting to let us know our time as their house guests had come to an end and it was time to leave sort of vibe. A little while later, days or weeks, I don't really remember the time exactly, but my wife and I were sitting on the couch and as we watched TV, that cable that I was reluctantly paying for, we heard this sort of slow squeaking sound. We looked around to see where it was coming from and it took a second for us to notice that it was the door to the linen closet in the hallway being opened because it was opening so slowly. The door had a mirror on the inside and we slowly watched as the door opened until we sat there staring at our own reflection. We just sort of sat there silent trying to find one impossible explanation for why our house couldn't actually be haunted. Very shortly afterward I got a new position and we were scheduled to move across the country. We had a garage sale and sold whatever items we could to reduce the amount of junk that we would otherwise have to pack or throw away. A few neighbors picked through our stuff and I eventually got into a conversation with an older gentleman about why we were moving. Yeah, I remember when this house first got here a few years ago, he said unsolicited. The house was in good condition but old. Old cabinets and fixtures, a pink toilet and a bathtub, he said. Something from the late 1970s or early 1980s. Something an old lady like my grandma would live in. Uh, sir, I said, correcting him. This house certainly wasn't built only a few years ago. No, that's when it first arrived here. The old house was brought in from somewhere else and put on this lot. If he had told me that some old lady had died in that house, I'm sure that I would have lost my mind. But I certainly wasn't going to ask him. I recently moved into an apartment building all the way up on the top floor. The balcony is at the back of the building. The view is mostly trees, but there's some houses and a street directly behind the apartment building, so I can see that too. Hopefully that makes sense. So, I usually sit out on the balcony at night, just listening to music. At night, the view is just darkness aside from the house porch lights and the road lit up by the street light. Most of the road view is covered by trees, but I can see a good amount of it. There's also no light from my balcony, so at night I just sort of sit there in the dark, aside from the light coming from my phone, that is. I was sitting out there at around 10pm or so, like I usually do, and I noticed movement from the road. When I looked down, I saw someone running down the road, like really fast. From a distance, it looked like this person was running faster than any human should. I was just watching when this person just stopped under a street lamp, under the light. I could tell this person was a man. I also realized that this person was now looking up at me. 
I got nervous, but I didn't move because I thought that I could just be overthinking, and maybe this guy wasn't actually looking at me. I mean, how could he? My phone wasn't on, so I was pretty much sitting in complete darkness. Could he really see me from all the way down there? I just kept sitting there, hoping the guy would leave, but when I saw him waving at me, that freaked me out. Now I knew that he was looking at me. I was too uncomfortable to do anything. I couldn't even go back inside. I just sat there, getting increasingly nervous. My thoughts started running a bit wild. I thought that this guy might find my apartment and try to break in or something. I also thought that he would somehow just sprint forward and climb up the building to get to me or something. But as I kept staring at this guy, waving at me, a sudden feeling of dread came over me. That's when I started grabbing my things to go back inside. But then I saw that he stopped waving. He reached both his arms out to the side and started swaying his body side to side, bending his knees as he moved and wiggled his arms around like a, a weird dance move. At this point, I was incredibly unsettled and just wanted to go back inside, but I was also slightly intrigued in a, a weird way and I guess I wanted to see what he might do next. Soon, the feelings of dread and unease took over and I continued closing up all of my stuff and I went inside. There was a window in the room next to the balcony though where you could see down to the same area so I peeked outside trying to stay hidden behind the wall. I saw this guy still moving around side to side but he soon stopped and I saw him just start booking it down the road again. I made sure my front door was locked and I went back to my room locking the bedroom door as well. My bedroom window looks out the same direction so I made sure that that guy was gone and then I closed my curtains. But as I was watching him run down the road, it was like he went behind a pole and just instantly disappeared. I didn't really sleep well that night. I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that I had. This happened a couple of nights ago and I haven't seen this guy since then. I've still been sitting out on the balcony but I've been getting really paranoid when I'm out there at night so I don't stay out there for as long as I used to. I don't really know what to make of this whole thing. I don't know who that guy was, or maybe what he was, I guess. I get really uncomfortable and paranoid when I think about that night, like I'm back in that moment feeling those exact feelings again. Also, since then, I get occasional waves of dread, like at times throughout the day I get the feeling like I'm just being watched. I hope that this feeling goes away soon, and I'm really hoping that I don't see that guy ever again. I'm of the mindset that everyone should know a little bit about cars. I've always been mechanically inclined too, and I think that that may have actually saved me. I was using dating apps a few years ago. Met this guy. He seemed super nice. We talked for a few weeks before I was willing to meet with him. His dad owned a local gun store where I would go to get my target stuff. I used to be in a woman's league for competition shooting. So I had seen this guy around and had a decent impression of him but wanted to be safe. He invited me to a concert at a local town site. It was a concert that I really wanted to go to as well and I figured that it would be safe since it was a, at a well-known place with a lot of security and all that. I let him pick me up because he had talked about mechanics and cars and he wanted to show me his Mustang. He bragged about how well he kept it running and how he babied it and all that. I was into time trial racing at that time, so I was interested to see what he had done. So he picks me up and we start heading to the event. Right before the exit, he says that his car is acting funny though. I was watching the dash and if you've been in racing, then you know that our cars and trucks usually have extra accessories and all that. Whether it's aftermarket racks and gauges or switches, there's usually something aftermarket inside the car. There was nothing extra. The car felt like it was shifting correctly. There was no shudder or noise, nothing to indicate any problems. I was like, that's weird, and all I said was we should try and limp it to the concert venue. It's less than a mile away, and it's better than being stuck on the I-15. He agrees and drives us very carefully the last mile. We get to the concert, and things were okay-ish, I guess. He kept watching me and buying me drinks. I refused to drink, though so every time he gave me one, I would make up an excuse and go to the bathroom and flush it. He kept making comments about how well I was handling my alcohol. 
I was super uncomfortable. The concert ends though and it's time to leave. For context, this concert happened at the local reservation town site and at the time the res did not have great cell service so I couldn't get a hold of anyone to come and get me. So I decided to bite the bullet and I talked him into taking the old highway instead of the 15. It sounds silly I know but when you take the old highway, even though it's slower, people are more willing to stop and help you than they are on the freeway. I figured that if he was having car troubles it would be safer and we wouldn't have people flying by us at like 80 miles per hour. So we make it halfway between the town side and our town and he says the car is acting funny again and pulls over. I'm stone cold sober and didn't notice anything wrong so when I get out of the car I go to check it out with him. He starts making comments though about how I'm drunk and I should wait in the car and that it'd be safer because you can't trust drunk Indians especially with a little girl like you. This dude had no idea that I was actually native. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up so I check my phone though and I just barely have service and start texting my dad. As I'm walking away from the engine compartment I notice that he was watching me so I started acting like I was trying to get cell service to get help. Out of the corner of my eye, I watch this man take the spark plug wires off the distributor cap and switch the order. Your spark plug wires connect to the distributor cap based on the order of your cylinders firing and so doing that will either make the car run terrible or not even turn on. I manage to send my dad a picture of what he was doing and my dad tells me to start walking. As I go to walk away, this guy gets back in the car and opens his glove box, which exposes a pistol that he had. He tells me not to worry and that we'll be safe. I probably broke a world record for how fast I was texting my dad. He starts telling me to just walk and tell the guy that he's on his way and that our friends live up the road. So I do. I start walking with a purpose and take off as quickly as I can. The guy is yelling after me and I yell back the wind is too loud and I can't hear you. I'll be back with our friends. I'm scared out of my mind. We're 10 miles out of town with no one around. The closest road actually led to a cemetery so there's really no one here to help me and I get a really bad feeling the farther that I get from the car. So I turn around and look and the hood is closed, the lights are on so I decide to hide in the farm irrigation next to the road. I keep walking towards town and text my dad what's happening all this time. I hear a car slowly coming up behind me and see a flashlight so I press against the side of the ditch and wait for it to pass. Once I can't hear it anymore, I crawl out and just kind of keep walking along the weeds. My dad texts me that he sees me, so when he pulls up, I run to the truck. As we make it towards the town, we actually pass the dude and he's got like three cop cars around him. My dad tells me not to worry about what happened and I heard through the grapevine later on that he had been charged with violent crimes in the past and that he'd been arrested that night for concealed carrying without a permit. The police never talked to me, but I haven't seen that guy in town ever since then. Which brings me back to why I think everyone should know at least a little bit about cars. If I didn't have experience with cars that day and didn't know what he was doing, I could have been dead in that ditch instead of hiding. Most communities have something where you can take basic car care and maintenance courses, and I highly recommend everyone takes them and at least knows the basics. This dude knew that I knew cars, but... His whole goal was to get me to get drunk and then I wouldn't realize what was happening. It was a frightening experience and these days I'm a lot more cautious. So we just moved into this apartment a week and a half ago. My son will be six months old tomorrow and he's got his own room. We live on the second floor of a two-story building. We only share our stairs with one other apartment and there are two underneath the two of ours so it is like we have four apartments in our little nook I guess you could say. When you walk up the stairs the second bedroom of both apartments has a window that you have to walk by to get to our front doors. Not my favorite but I always make sure it's locked and the only people walking by should be the person who lives across from us since they're the only ones with reason to come up the stairs. The way the room is laid out too is when you walk in, you come into a corner. On the wall, coming off the right of the door, there are two more. It's his closet and bathroom. I have his crib in between those two doors, his changing table dresser and all that are in his closet. 
If you stand by his crib and flip 180, you'll see the wall with the window. And from left to right on that wall, I have this rocking chair, a cart with a lamp, books, pictures, all those things that we need for when rocking and whatnot. Then I have a little shatterproof mirror for him on the wall by the floor. Then it's his little play corner with bookshelves and toy shelves and going around the corner is more shelves and his ball pit. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, on the windowsill I had this baby monitor. We have one of those video monitors that we were gifted for his baby shower and I like this one because it can't connect to phones or outside technology, only to the device's own screen or control panel that stays in our room. Something you should know too is that we were blessed with a baby who has slept through the night since he was three months old. About four or five nights ago, my son woke up though at exactly midnight screaming and crying, Mama. He's just had his first word about two weeks now and he uses it like crazy. But I rushed in and shushed him and rocked him back to sleep. When I got back to our bed, I didn't even look at the monitor, I just sort of crashed. In the morning, I went to look at it and when I woke up, it was facing outside. Like, the whole camera unit had somehow turned itself around. It does have a pan back and forth feature, but this was not that. I mean, the whole thing had been shifted around. I rushed in and checked, and everything else was as it should be. My son was fast asleep. I asked my husband if he had moved it, and he looked confused and said that he slept all night. The thing is, is that... I instantly ran in there when I heard him crying and didn't even glance at the monitor, so I don't know if it happened before or after I went in there to check on him. Anyway, fast forward a few days and nothing else is out of the ordinary. Then tonight I see weird stuff on the monitor. I'd say it almost looked like smoke swaying back and forth in front of it. My husband saw it too, so we both went into his room, but there was nothing so we decided that it was either a bug, a mist from his humidifier, or maybe just a trick of the light or something. Now it's 1am, my son wakes up from a dead sleep screaming again. I say, I'll go, and I roll out of bed. I shush my son back to sleep and go to set him down, and as I do, I hear four consecutive knocks, either on or outside the window, just booms. I don't know how to describe it other than it sounded like someone was knocking on a door quite loud too. I rush over and pull back the blinds and absolutely no one is outside. The window is locked and there's nothing there. But I know what I heard. It was clear as day. I waited a few more minutes and came back to bed after checking all the windows and the doors, but I can't help but think that maybe there's something here. Unless there is a logical explanation, I'm very open to that too, but in fact, that's my favorite choice for what's going on here. But does anyone have any advice or insight? Also, I'll say this at the risk of losing some people here, but I'm very sensitive to the paranormal and I've not had bad or any weird vibes or anything in the house, except for the two nights that he woke up screaming. But that could also be mum anxiety, right? Anyway, if you have any idea as to what to do about all this, then please... To help me. When I was about five or six years old, I was brought into a hospital due to a serious infection and a large cut on my knee. Since I wasn't able to walk without taking a 30 minute break every 10 minutes, I was mostly in the room that I was given. Back then, I didn't really have a good relationship with my sister, so she barely stayed in my room. This was eventually where the problem started. On about my third night of my hospitalization is when I started experiencing extreme paranoia every time that I was the only one in the room. For some reason, I always thought that someone was staring at me from the bathroom doorframe, and it was the sixth night that had confirmed my fears. My sister had been watching me when my mum was at work for a few hours. Since it was her fault, I even got the infection. I didn't talk to her and just wanted to sleep. When I woke up, the TV was off. The only light were the buttons near my bed and on my bed, and my sister was gone. I couldn't really see in the dark that well, but all of a sudden I noticed a silhouette in the doorway of the bathroom. I knew that it wasn't sleep paralysis too, because I could move just fine. So, being prone to freezing up when scared, I didn't move though. 
The silhouette was shaped in the form of a tall figure and I could barely make out something was there but there was definitely something. For what felt like hours too that thing just stood there and I stared at it and I could see it more and more as my eyes adjusted to the dark that there was somebody there. And after a while I just tried to ignore it I guess and I went back to sleep. And I know it's strange to say but I could just feel it staring at me. I tried everything too, talking to it, squeezing my eyes shut, calling for one of the nurses or even my sister and much more but in the end I just was alone in that room with this silhouette just standing there. I ended up having to spend the whole night with it staring at me, not being able to sleep or anything. When I finally started to see the sun coming up it just all of a sudden disappeared. I tried to tell everyone about it and Nobody believed me, saying that it was just a kid's imagination. But even years later, I think about from time to time what happened that night, and I get scared of shadows, and things shaped like what I saw those years ago, but I know what I saw. There was somebody there in that room with me that night. Who they were, what they wanted, I don't know, but I'm certain that I saw someone there standing in the doorframe that night. This happened when I was about 16 years old, so over 20 years ago. I have five younger siblings and my little sister would have been five years old. We lived in a, a pretty bad neighborhood at the time, in the housing projects pretty much, and our neighbor was nice but she always had sketchy looking people hanging around, especially men. But one day too, these two new guys started hanging out there every day. They'd always be outside smoking or just sitting on a porch and stuff. They made me just really uncomfortable too. They were always staring at me and would sometimes try to get me to walk over and talk to them. Or they'd come over into our yard when my parents weren't home and talk to me. Asking me if I had a boyfriend and asking me if I wanted some beer or weed or whatever. I was a goody two shoes Mormon girl so I was always like no thank you I have to go inside now. They were probably both around 30 years old or so and then they started coming over and asking to use our phone when my parents weren't home. My parents always let the neighbors use our phone so I never said no but I would just pass it through the door and make them stay on the porch. They'd sometimes ask to come in or try to talk to me but I would tell them no because my parents weren't home. Now I realize how dumb that was because they could have just pushed the door open but I was raised to ignore red flags and be polite and sweet at all times. Anyway, we had a little dog and I always took him outside early in the morning on a leash. I was out one morning and one of the guys came outside and stood there staring at me for a few minutes and then went back in. I brought the dog back inside and just a few minutes later there's a quiet knock on the door. I opened it and both the guys are there and one of them says... Hey, uh, we just saw your baby sister out by the highway. You need to come and get her. I panicked and ran outside with them. I started to run down our street towards the highway and one of them says, uh, No, we'll drive you down there. We need to hurry. I seriously took two steps towards their truck too before I realized what was going on. I stopped and said that I needed to go back inside into my parents and the man closest to me grabbed my arm and jerked me towards the truck yelling, we have to go now, she's going to get hit by a car. I instantly felt sick and just yelled, let go of me. He dropped my arm and I ran back inside my house. I ran into my parents' bedroom to wake them up and my little sister was sleeping in their bed with them. I woke everyone up because... I was freaking out and my dad ran outside and the guys in their truck were gone. I never did see them again either at my neighbor's house. I wish that I could say that my parents called the police or something but they just kind of shrugged it off and made excuses like maybe they saw another kid that looked like your sister. I know deep down that that was just not the case. This is something that happened to me when I was a kid and I just wanted to share the story since it stuck with me for so long. I was about 7 or 8 years old, can't recall exactly but it was around that age. 
and one weekend I was visiting my grandparents who at the time lived in the countryside. I'm from Bosnia, Europe. They were only about uh, maybe an hour's drive away and we went there early in the morning. Their house is in this wooded area with a long winding road leading up to each individual house, of which there weren't many, maybe three or four at most. I knew the area well though since I went to visit almost every weekend. Besides going up to the houses, there's one section of the road that leads directly into the woods, sort of like a natural trail I guess. Our car broke down exactly around that spot, flat tire. Since we were very close to where my grandparents live, and my folks knew that I was familiar with the area, they let me go for a walk while my dad fixed the tire. This was at about maybe 9 or 10 in the morning, so they weren't really afraid to let me run around a bit. Being the curious kid that I was, still am, I went for the forest trail since the main dirt road wasn't very exciting. The trees were very tall and dense, so even during daytime it was kind of dark. I went up the forest trail for a few hundred meters in until I came to the crossroads. Now, this was more than 20 years ago, but it left a lasting impression on me, so here's what I recall. In the middle of the crossroads, at the very point at the road's fork, there was a small sort of cave or opening of some sort. I went a bit closer and I noticed what seemed like fireflies sparkling into the pitch black hole. I'm not sure if fireflies even light up during the day, but that's how I remember it. Besides that, I just felt this, uh, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but the best way I can describe it is presence, as if I wasn't alone there, as if the cavern was beckoning me to enter it. And then I noticed what seemed like several pairs of smaller red eyes peering from the darkness. At this point, I was quite spooked, thinking it was maybe an animal of some kind, and I decided not to go any further and just sort of slowly backed away. This is in Southeast Europe, so there aren't really many dangerous animals around. Pretty rarely you'll see a wolf or a bear, but that's really unusual. Not near human settlements, too. Anyway, nothing followed me and I had no trouble getting back. I decided not to tell my parents about this since I figured that they would be mad and wouldn't let me play unsupervised for the remainder of our visit. But they decided to leave me with my grandparents and pick me up on Monday while they went back during the afternoon. Now, I'm very close with my grandmother. She and I are very alike, especially now as a grown-up. So I told her about the encounter that I had, and she kind of laughed it off saying, Honey, there's nothing there, and I walk there every day, but I was adamant about what I saw, and she agreed that we'd go for a walk together and visit that spot. It wasn't far from her house, and we arrived there that same afternoon. We got to the crossroads, and just like she said, there was nothing there. No burrow or cave, just a, a flat spot where the crossroads met. No traces of it being dug up or buried or anything. My grandma even asked me, are you sure that it was here? And I replied yes. She didn't think much of it, chalking it up to just childish imagination, but she told me not to venture out here on my own again. We continued our walk and I just stopped mentioning the event from then on pretty much. But to this day, even after all these years, I still remember this quite vividly. I even find it strange that I'm able to recall the details. And of course, I know memories can become distorted over time and that what we think we remember may not always be the, the full picture since our minds love to fill in the blanks, but I just don't feel that this is the case. I often contemplate what would have happened had I stepped closer or worse, tried to enter that dark cave. I've read about evil places in forests around the world or places where time and space can become warped and things of this nature. People walking into what they describe as different timelines or alternate dimensions. And perhaps this was one of these places? I don't know, but all I can do is really speculate. My grandparents don't live there anymore too. Grandpa had passed away when I was 16 years old and my grandma moved to the city in the same building as me and my folks. We still own the house and the land there, but I haven't been there since. My dad goes out there a few times a year just to check up on things and clean up a bit. According to him, the house or land have almost been consumed by all the vegetation around it. They cut the electricity, water and stuff so they wouldn't have to pay bills, so it's not very convenient staying over there or anything, but I do plan on going there sometime, perhaps during my next time off or vacation from work or something. 
I really want to go back to that road, assuming that it still exists, and just see if I feel anything or see anything. Now that I'm an adult with an interest in the paranormal, I'm really drawn to this memory, and I just want to, I don't know, try and figure out what that may have been. So on that note, I would love it if any of you guys have also experienced something similar, if you could share it. I would really appreciate to hear some of your thoughts. So let me start off by saying that paranormal is normal for my family. So ghosts, spirits, spooks, whatever you would like to call them, have never been a taboo subject for us. Growing up, you would see something and you would tell someone, and everyone listens and gives advice. And so, I grew up never being afraid of the paranormal and was taught to be respectful. My whole life I have experienced paranormal activity, so it happens and I move on into my senior year of high school. Again, I was taught to respect the dead, so I've never gone like ghost hunting or tried messing with spirits or anything of the sort. If you do, that's fine. I, I was just taught not to, so each to their own. Anyway, senior year comes around and I was given an assignment to find ancestors in town and see how far back you could find relatives. My grandmother told me and my cousin, a junior at the time, about an old cemetery that she believed a cousin was buried in and how to get there and whatnot. So we go and find her grave and get the information. We thanked her for allowing us to gather her tombstone information and to rest in peace. But the whole time we were there, my cousin and I felt very off though, like we were being watched and not in a good way, as if there is a good way though, right? Anyway, I, I go home and everything is fine until I go to bed and have that same feeling. I'm laying in bed but staring at my door into the hallway and feeling as if someone is there just watching me. This continues for months too, and I thought that I was the only one who noticed until my brother, 10 at the time, started asking me if he could sleep in my room with me because he's scared of the hallway. He told me that he felt like someone was watching him from the hallway and that it felt bad. I agreed that it wasn't a pleasant energy like what a family member or maybe just a spirit passing through feels like. This was a very dark and eerie feeling, so I told him that it was fine and we both laid in my bed staring at the hallway and felt eyes on us. We both said the Lord's Prayer and we went to bed. We're not a super religious family by any means, but me and my brother felt at that moment that we needed to say that prayer for whatever reason. I graduated high school and things calmed down a little. The feelings seemed to go away is what I mean. Until that morning. You see, my mum went to work and my brother went to school. I got up and I got in the shower and as I was washing my hair, a heavy feeling just crashed down on me and again I felt like I was being watched. I turned my head to look to the side and there, on the other side of the distorted glass shower door, was a tall dark figure I could see a head and shoulders, but no other features except the red eyes. I screamed and threw open the shower door, and as soon as I opened it, it was gone. I quickly closed the door to check if it was still there, but whatever was there was now missing. Quickly, I got out, getting dressed, wrapping my shampooed hair in a towel, and leaving the house, going straight to my grandmother's, and told her everything, bawling my eyes out. She looked as scared as I did. My grandmother believes that it was a shadow person. Me and my mother had been fighting a lot, as well as full-blown screaming matches, which we never did before the trip to the cemetery. Grandma called my mum, and they called someone to cleanse our house. I never went back after that, though, and I moved out because I was just too scared to go back. But my mum sold the house, and I still get horrible feelings when I drive by it. And that is the worst paranormal experience I've ever had, but I have years of stories. I'm currently 29, so there's a fair few of them, but if anyone wants more, I can definitely share more. Honestly, though, be careful where you go and what you bring home with you. Don't make the same mistake that I did. I have no idea who or what it was, but I'm now terrified of that house, and it took almost a year before I stopped having panic attacks in the shower after it too because, man, it was frightening.
To give a little bit of context, I used to work in an apartment complex, and as a result, I've had my fair share of uh, creepy encounters, I guess you could say. Most residents, they keep to themselves and don't cause issues, probably about maybe 95%, but the other 5% took up almost all of my time. Isaac was one of the 5%. When he first rented his apartment, he definitely had stoner vibes, but he was nice enough and passed his background check. Almost immediately though, he started causing issues. The lady next door complained that she could smell his smoke constantly. The guy downstairs complained that he could hear his stereo all hours of the day and night. Another resident accused him of following him home one night. The police were regularly there, breaking up fights between him and his girlfriends too. We caught him hiding two large dogs in his apartment, and he regularly let them run loose, which ultimately resulted in another dog and two people getting attacked, and he accidentally discharged a gun in his apartment once too. Needless to say, he caused a lot of issues. At first, he was very apologetic and said that he would make an effort to remedy the problems, but things just kept getting worse and after a year of weekly calls or notices from the office, he eventually became standoffish. One morning too, I received a call from Isaac letting me know that he'd broken up with one of his girls and she wouldn't leave the apartment. He asked me to personally come up and remove her. I'm a small woman, so even if I wanted to take the risk, I physically wouldn't be able to wrestle an angry woman out of the apartment. I suggested that he call the police, but he then asked if I could make a maintenance man come up to remove her. I offered to call the police on his behalf, but Isaac said that he didn't want to involve them and hung up. A few hours later, Isaac came down to the office with a, a jump drive and said that he needed to print out a 50 plus page document. Residents weren't technically allowed to use our officer printer, but on the rare occasion someone asked who, I usually didn't say no. It was an easy way to build good rapport after all, but between Isaac becoming such a problem tenant and how large his document was, I told him that I couldn't print his document. I gave the excuse that our paper, toner, or printer history was monitored, and we would get in trouble for printing such a large document out for him. Not liking my answer, he started screaming all sorts of obscenities and he accused me of being useless, bringing up my refusal to fight his ex and power tripping and he called me names multiple times and said someone needed to bring me down a peg and stuff like this. I was pretty over him at this point and told him that if he was going to behave like a child that he needed to leave. He told me that I couldn't make him and bluntly I told him that he would leave or I would call the police and have him removed. I also told him that I would ban him from the office going forward. Normally I, I try to kill the residents with kindness, but his lease was ending in a week and I didn't care anymore if he hated me. My threat? It seemed to work too. He angrily knocked my pen holder over and then slammed both doors hard as he left. And the following morning though, there was a police officer waiting for me when I got to work. He asked if Isaac was a resident and I confirmed that he was. The officer explained that the body of a person had been discovered the day before and Isaac was apparently their prime suspect. He was the last person to text this person asking him to meet him where this body was and he was found shortly after the message. The police believed that Isaac had been paid to kill him and based on the timing of the text and when the boy was discovered... Isaac would have had to have left my office and pretty much gone directly there. And that is pretty terrifying to think about. Ultimately, the police wanted to use Isaac's move out day as an opportunity to try and catch him. But to nobody's surprise, he didn't show up. When I walked his apartment to inspect for damage, and there was a lot. I found a bank receipt from the day of the murder... Someone had wired him $17,000. Thankfully, I never did see Isaac again, but I did find out that he was caught in another country a few months later, and is now in prison. I really discovered a love for walking and later hiking over lockdown. There were days that I would spend hours out traveling the country roads, across fields, and through the woods. 
I live on the outskirts of a small town in Ireland, so the walks were a great form of exercise without using a gym. It started with me and my dad just going out for about an hour every day, but he knew that I wanted more and told me to go on my own if he wasn't up for it, or if I wanted to go further than usual. It was around July of 2021. I was 14 at the time, and even though the lockdown was starting to ease, I still went walking. I decided to walk through fields instead of the roads because having to stop for cars really irks me. I came to a plot of land with trees planted and decided to splash the boots before turning back. I was almost finished too when I started hearing laughter from behind me. I pulled up my zip and buckled my belt to face whoever was there and I was surprised to see five people. None of them could have been much older than me and one of them waved and I walked towards them. They were between me and my way back home, so I sort of had to anyway, but the group had been talking amongst themselves, but stopped when I met them. There were three boys and two girls. They all had bags or backpacks, and were all similarly dressed in sort of dark graphic t-shirts. I remember one specifically had a, a Thrasher t-shirt as well, and black cargos with funny looking keychains. A bit of a weird sight considering things like skate culture aren't really big where I am from and anyone who's ever owned a nice piece of clothing wouldn't wear it out in a place where they could trip into a cow pat. Anyway, the guy with the Thrasher t-shirt smiled and asked, what are you doing out here? I realized that it must have been a bit weird to meet a stranger in the absolute, pretty much back of nowhere, so I just said, oh, uh, I'm taking a shortcut through the back road. Another boy chimes in and says, don't lie, I saw you taking a pee in the woods. It dawned on me that they were both too well spoken to be anyone local. I felt a little bit intimidated to be honest, so I just told him nature was calling, as jokingly as I could. To which they all laughed. I wasn't sure if it was my accent that they found funny or the fact that they caught me where I was and I was made visibly embarrassed, but... One of the two girls breaks from the laughter and pulls a face of disgust. She says, well, What are you doing with that necklace? Referring to the cross necklace that I was wearing. It didn't really scan with me how serious she was, so I just let out a chuckle, but the four others stopped laughing. The girl who spoke pulled out a book from a, a tote bag that she had worn over her shoulder and said, You've probably already ruined this by weeing everywhere on the ground anyway as if I was supposed to know what this was. But the five of them all genuinely looked gutted, as if I had just genuinely ruined their day or something. I responded with, I don't really know what you mean. And all of a sudden, a, a bleating noise came out from the thrasher guy's bag. I look at him and the group starts to act sort of skittish. The girl with the book says, let's just look for a good spot, and walks past me. I turn and see the thrasher guy's backpack looks sort of lumpy. At the time, I really didn't know what was in there, but as I was nearly home, around 40 minutes later, I walked past a field with sheep and I realized that they must have stolen an animal from one of the farms. I told my parents later that day that I was away cycling. I took the bike as far away as I could and jogged to where I last saw the group disappear into the trees. I look around and there was a dead lamb with several shallow gashes all over it, with some of its wool almost pulled out. The number five in blue spray paint was still partly visible as well. I'm guessing that they left it there after cutting it and it bled out and died. I don't believe in that satanic panic antichrist thing, but I know that they were probably sacrificing this lamb for some reason or another. I was helping my friend, who I told this story to with farmhand work the week after, and all of his livestock were accounted for, meaning that I have a rough idea of which field they got this sheep from, but I didn't want to ask the owner in case he thought that I had something to do with its disappearance. Me and my friend went back to the wooded area too, because I didn't want him to think that I was messing with him, that I was being truthful and honest, but after that, I, I haven't been back since. I've been working on two Native American reservations for about a year and a half now. On the current reservation, I have not had any memorable experiences with the paranormal, but last year I had multiple at the other. The first started when I was sleeping in the basement of the house that I was in, due to not having enough rooms. 
I was laying on my bed trying to sleep but was unable due to too much light coming in and I was night shift. As I lay there I heard a cardboard box with some of my belongings in it drag across the floor. I turned and looked at the direction the sound came from and didn't see anything. I got up, walked around into the room. Nothing looked out of place but I couldn't remember if that's where I left it so I went back to bed and when I laid down I heard footsteps above me but I knew that nobody else was in the home. I just sort of ignored it and eventually I fell asleep. Later I found out other people heard footsteps in that house too and another person saw a shadow person later in the basement. Anyway, when I came back a month later I was in a different home. After about two weeks I was laying in my bed on my phone when I heard a very loud knocking on my bedside table, three of them, right behind me. I turned to look but saw nothing. A friend attempted to replicate on the window and the door and nothing sounded the same other than that table. Less than a week from then, I rolled from one side of the bed to the other and as I rolled, I saw an approximately three foot tall, all black shadow run across the foot of the bed. And I can tell you that I almost soiled myself when I saw it. I asked locals if they knew anything like that and was told about Wawila. I'm unsure of the spelling or pronunciation, but there are little people that play pranks apparently. After that, I never had another experience in that home after seeing it, but where I was working, there were many stories of different spirits in different areas of the facility. Late at night, walking around, I always felt like I was being watched too. One night I was sitting in my chair when, in the corner of my eye, I saw a tall opaque shadow walk into the room and disappear into the shadow of a door. I let it go as the other person in the room didn't see anything, but then they had to leave making me the only person in that room, and as I looked up, I see movement on the blinds, similar to a faint shadow of a, a tallish man sit down, wearing a, a hat of all things. I freaked out, and... I left until she came back. I asked other employees and they said that that corner used to have their table and chair and that they've seen that man come in many times and sit there. Obviously I can't confirm their sightings but what I can confirm is my own eyes. I know what I saw and it was there and it's scary to think about. In my late teens and early 20s, I was friends with a girl named Lucy. She was a very lonely kind of girl whose parents were, well, honestly, pretty terrible parents. Her mother was verbally abusive, and her father really couldn't care less about anything. Because of the lack of love in her life, Lucy searched through dating sites for love and comfort from strange men, and she was not afraid of meeting them face to face, even if they'd been chatting for only a few days. My friendship with Lucy was a, a strange one too. I found her quite annoying sometimes, but I also felt awful for her because of her loneliness and lack of friends and love in her life. Sometimes I really didn't want to hang out with her and some days I would accept her offer to hang out. But when it was just her and I together, she was normal and okay to be around, but also very appreciative of having someone giving her attention, I guess. We had a small group of friends and she would try to get us all together as often as possible and honestly the whole group together was really quite fun. But when we were all together Lucy was very hyper and you could just tell that she was happy to be around people and didn't insult her as her mother does. But suddenly Lucy tells us that she has a boyfriend. We were all pretty surprised about this because we knew that she met a lot of guys online but we had never heard her say that she was dating someone. Anyway, a few days later, she sets up our day for our friend group to meet Trevor. None of us were looking forward to it because we thought that he was going to be like all the others, a temporary toy boy. And when we met him, we all felt awkward. He barely spoke a word, he wouldn't look directly at any of us at all. Lucy would try to be funny, but he would just give her dirty looks. Needless to say, we thought that he was a weird one and could tell that he didn't care much for her. As the days went on, Lucy kept telling me about how much Trevor did not like me. This was weird too because no one ever disliked me. 
I mean, I'm always polite, respectful, and I smile a lot at everyone. But for some reason, he just did not like me. She kept saying that he thinks that I'm using Lucy for her money. Not sure how he thought that, since I paid for everything for Lucy. To keep this piece of the story short, though, I think he was trying to find reasons to convince her to get rid of me. I got a terrible vibe from Trevor as well. He dressed like he didn't care about life, he never smiled, he didn't shake our hands when first meeting us, he stank of weed, and really just had an overall uncomfortable feeling about him. After months of Trevor trying to convince Lucy that I'm a terrible friend and she should not hang out with me anymore, she started to do as he said. She would start to hide me from him. If she and I were together and he would call her on her phone, she would lie and say that I wasn't there. If she was with the group of friends, he would have her swear that I wasn't there. When he was going to be joining the group on an outing or just hanging out at her place, she would tell me that I couldn't come. Lucy would do whatever a boyfriend says just to keep pleasing him so she doesn't lose them. Now, here's where it gets scary. Lucy calls me one day and says that she wants me to come hang out at her place and I agreed. She came to pick me up and we went to her house and watched TV for a bit. We then decided, since it's a nice day outside, we would take her two dogs for a walk to a nearby pocket park and would later return to the house to have lunch together. While at this park, she receives a phone call. Now, let me say that Lucy is not a private person whatsoever and has never ever walked away to answer a phone call until this day. She walked far away enough that she knew that I would not be able to hear anything that she said. This was suspicious to me, but not enough to question it. The call ends and she begins walking toward me with a look on her face as if she's trying not to smile. She tells me, so I need to bring you home now. I was slightly confused as we'd only been together for like an hour when we usually spend the entire day together and she would never want me to just go home. She would even frequently beg me to sleep over to avoid being alone. Well, anyway, I, I just said okay and... We walked to drop off her dogs at the home and we got into her car and off we went. About 10 minutes into the car ride, I realized that she isn't going in the direction of my house, so I questioned it. Where are we going? She smirked but didn't respond. I asked again, laughing uncomfortably, seriously, where are we going? She continued to smirk but didn't want to answer me. I started to realize that she was heading in the direction of where her boyfriend lived and I thought, oh heck no. I asked one more time with anger in my voice, where are you taking me? Her only response was bone chilling. Trevor wants to talk to you. And no way I was having any of this. I insisted and demanded that she let me out of the car, but with her evil smirk and same response, she said it again. It's okay, he just wants to talk to you. I was furious at this point because this creepy guy who looks like he wants to kill someone, who also despised me, wanted to talk to me. Why can't he talk to me on the phone? Why do I need to go to his sketchy apartment? She absolutely refused to let me out of the car. She had the doors locked as if I wasn't able to unlock my passenger door. I waited until she reached a red light. Then I grabbed her wallet from the back seat and took out her bus pass and bolted out of the car. I had no idea where I was or where the nearest bus stop was, but I was not about to let her crazy boyfriend do whatever he wanted to me. She yelled for me to get back into the car, but of course I ignored her. She sped off furiously and I immediately blocked her number on my phone. I removed her as my friend on social media and immediately warned the group of friends not to talk to her because she's gone nuts. And I haven't spoken to her since that very day and... She also lost the other five friends of the group as well, unfortunately. In any case, after this situation, Lucy, I really hope that you're truly lonely now. This experience happened to my roommates and I in our second year of university. The city that we went to school in was considered a very safe university town too. The most that we had heard of happening was drunk morons doing typical, well, drunk moron things. This was also the first time that we were all really living on our own. First year residents are nice, but it's basically an extended summer camp rather than a, a typical living situation. 
So, the four of us girls lived in a nice townhouse that never once had a creepy vibe or weird neighbours in the months that we had lived there. The only eerie part was that every weekend, we were the only people who stayed in the complex. All of our neighbours either went home or stayed elsewhere until returning Monday for classes. This was never something that we had given a second thought to, to be honest, considering that was fairly normal for a uni town, especially because our complex was only made up of about four other townhouses. But the complex was surrounded by walking trails and farm fields, which we loved. It was like our quiet spot away from the chaos of college kids. There were a few farmhouses that we could see from our backyard, but other than that, we were fairly secluded. The university was about a 20 minute bus ride away, which was never a big deal for any of us, especially because the rent was far cheaper here than in places that were within walking distance to the campus. Being 5'6", I was the tallest by a considerable amount. I was also the only one out of the group that had been in a handful of scary situations in the past. Due to this, I was the only one up to this point who would lock the doors, windows and garage before leaving or going to bed. My roommates, they all grew up in a small very safe town so it was uncommon for them to lock doors back at home. They were also incredibly kind and trusting to everyone, never considering hidden bad intentions. Anyway, the night in question started very normally. We had planned on having a wine and a movie night. This was kind of like a weekly tradition for us. We would pick out some stupid movie, get takeout, and get a little buzz after having a long week of classes and work. At this point, it was early November, so we had been doing this for several months with no issues. By 8.30ish, we had all settled on the couch in our living room and had started a comedy. With it being November, it was already completely dark outside. That is, other than our porch light, which we could see from the small window at the very top of our door. None of us were tall enough to see anything out of our window anyway, so we just relied entirely on our peephole. It took a great amount of effort for me to convince my roommates to check the peephole before opening the door. This was a talk that we had after one roommate had opened the door for our neighbor's very drunk friend, who threw up all over our main floor. That was not a nice day. And not long after ordering our takeout, we heard banging on our front door. Jess made a joke about how the delivery guy must have taken a helicopter to get here this quickly, especially considering the place that we ordered from was very close to campus. It was not a typical delivery guy's knock either, but between the few glasses of wine and carefree attitude of the night, we didn't really pay too much mind, I guess. In any case, it was my roommate's turn to pay this week. Her name is Meg, and out of the group, she was the smallest, barely five foot. She is also the most trusting person that I think I've ever met. She ran up to her room to grab her wallet. This took at most 30 seconds. And during this time, the banging continued and was getting more aggressive. I figured maybe it was cold or he had other stuff to do, so we yelled up to get her to hurry and the banging continued to get harder and harder. And it was at this point that I started to feel a bit uneasy. But when she came back down, I told her to check the peephole before opening it as she was usually the one to just open it. She got to the door and looked out the peephole. She could barely reach it on a good day, so when she said that she couldn't see anything, my other roommate and I got up to help. But my second roommate, Jess, is a very funny person, and there are very few things that she would not turn into a joke. But Jess got to the door before I did, looked out of the peephole, the person on the other side still banging away, mind you, and when she turned to look at me, I knew instantly that something was wrong. She looked incredibly confused, a look that I had rarely seen from her as she was very clever. Within a second, she had gone back in for another look as well. This time, her face was not confused. She looked afraid. This made my stomach knot up. She's a horror movie fanatic and she doesn't scare easily. I think someone's covering the peephole, she sort of whisper shouted at us. This time I looked out the peephole, seeing that, yes, something was covering the peephole. We could still see the porch light shining through the window at the top though, so we knew that it was not a case of it being too dark to be able to see what was going on. By now, our other roommate, Anne, had walked down the hall trying to find out what was going on. She was easily the drunkest of the four of us. Even sober though, she seemed to think that she was invincible. What's your problem? Open the door, the poor dude has hands full. 
was Anne's wise idea. Jess and I explained what was going on though, and at this point, Meg, Jess and I all had a bad gut feeling that something was wrong. That's when Jess asked Meg to check the website that she had ordered our food from. And Meg had actually not placed the order. Between the wine and the silliness earlier in the night, she had selected our food but didn't finish the last step. The banging continued as our situation started to sink in. Anne still did not seem to grasp what was happening and tried to unlock the door. Stop! I snapped at her. Immediately, I knew it was too loud. For the first time, the person on the other side of the door spoke. They said, this is the police. Open the door now. We have a few questions to ask you. The man's voice practically growled back at us. This sobered me up right away. I looked over at Meg, who was already welling up, then at Jess, who had gone completely pale. At this point, Anne also realized something was not right and froze, which is the least Anne thing that she could have done. The banging was getting increasingly harder, to the point that we could physically see the door breathe with each hit. Meg took Anne upstairs, trying to calm each other down and check if there was a police car parked outside and make sure our windows were locked. And though it was hard to do, it was possible to get onto part of our roof that made it possible to get to Anne's window. We heard a window slam, immediately knowing that it had been Anne's window. Being a bit of a thrill seeker, Anne had taken her window screen in order to sit on the roof, and for some reason this made what was happening very real. Show me your badge and then we'll open the door, I yelled back. Instead of a response, it sounded like the guy started to kick the door now. I told Jess to call the police and ask if they had an officer dispatched to our address. Jess was shaking so badly at this point that it was hard for her to dial. Now, Meg had come back down the stairs, sharing that there was no police car parked outside. Anne trailed behind her, standing on the stair landing, trying to get a good look outside the window at the top of the door. At that moment, my blood ran cold too, because I remembered that the man at the door had said we and not I. Jess had just come to the same realization too. She sprinted out the back door, a large sliding glass door, which she double checked it was locked, and thankfully it had been. She drew the curtains as well, trying to minimize the chance of them seeing in. Within a minute, the knocking started at our back door as well. Thank God she had closed the curtains because the idea of seeing whoever was doing this would give me chills. Uncover the peephole and show me your badge, I yelled trying to sound as intimidating as a young college girl could, but we were met with silence, which was so much worse than the banging. What's your badge number at least? Prove to us that you're the police, I screamed trying to keep my voice from breaking. The only response that I got back was a gravely, I can't do that. Jess had handed her phone off to Meg who was sobbing now trying to speak to the dispatcher. The banging now coming from both sides of the house must have been heard by the operator. Is there someone trying to break in? She asked Meg, obviously being unable to understand her. Meg frantically asked if police had been sent to her house. The answer that we all knew by now was no. Meg babbled that at least two men tried to get us to unlock the door by impersonating a police officer. Try to stay calm and stay on the phone with me. Police are on their way to your address, the operator told Meg. How long will they be? Meg asked back. No more than ten minutes, she responded. That made Meg cry harder, realizing just how long 10 minutes really is. The door was being hit so hard that I was worried that it was about to break too. Jess ran back toward our back door, making me worry that our kitchen window had been open. Trying to think, I put a chair under the doorknob and sat down hoping the door would hold. Jess came back to the front door, holding a kitchen knife and a fire extinguisher, which were really the only things that we had to protect ourselves with in case they got in. Anne, now sitting on the landing, flinched with each hit. Anne was farm tough and had no issue dealing with animals three times her size. But what was happening now, though, was entirely different. We had nothing to really deter whoever wanted in. No prods and no backup until the police showed up. Which was not like something that she was used to. She grew up having her family as her neighbors her whole life. And if anything were happening, her uncles and grandfather were at the front door in a minute flat. Anne's I'm invincible attitude was long gone at this point in other words. She was now as scared as the rest of us, only having some wood and glass keeping these men out. 
and each hit to the back door made me expect that whoever was there to break through the glass was about to occur. Open the door! The man yelled at us, not caring if we thought that they were the police anymore. Then it got very quiet again, which made me terrified. The only thing worse than what was happening was not knowing where the men were. The idea that both men, or maybe even multiple men, moving to the back door made me absolutely terrified. If they really wanted to, it would take very little effort to smash through that plate glass. Instead, the knocking at the back door had completely ceased. Within seconds of that, the front door started being hit again. Trying to wrap my mind around why they would leave the easiest entry for a heavy wood door, I realized the back door was actually visible to the main road. But whether they had seen a car or heard us talking to the police, they were smart enough to not want to be seen by anyone. Jess then said something that I had not thought of. I don't think they want to rob us. There are so many houses that are empty. Why would they come to the only house with lights on, she hissed. My whole body went cold at that. I didn't have an answer. All I could say was, you're right. Meg clearly felt the same because at this point she was practically hyperventilating. The three of us stayed quiet for a minute, awful scenarios running through our heads, and moved back up the last few steps and out of sight of us. The operator, who we had forgotten was on speaker, spoke which practically made me jump out of my skin. She must have felt how terrified we were and she tried to calm us down. The police are two minutes away now. They have their sirens turned off and the lights are on. You should be able to see them very soon. Stay on the phone with me so that I can confirm when they're outside for you, she said. The men outside were starting to seem desperate. The sound of glass shattering had me turn to the back door, fully expecting to go into a fence, but the door was still intact somehow. Instead, our porch light, the only light illuminating our dark street, went out, which put two and two together for me. Understanding that they had destroyed the only way that we would have been able to identify whoever was on the other side was clever. It was at this point that they swore at us, yelled expletives, and threatened us. Whoever was at the back door as well, they spat at the door. This was worse than the initial speaker. It was full of so much hate and venom that it scared me more than the banging. He was so calm, intent on whatever his goal was, and it didn't feel like how the first man had sounded. Up until this point, I could have convinced myself that they had wanted our valuables, but this voice made me understand that he wanted us. To this day, I have never heard a voice come close to that level of malice. It sounded like he wanted to inflict serious harm on us, and if he had gained entry, I know that he would have. Somehow, I wanted the first man to speak again instead of whichever sick person had just spoken. I looked at Meg... I know how terrified I must have looked too. Until now, I may have done a half-decent job at hiding how scared I was, but that voice ruined my ability to stay stone-faced. Meg looked like a little scared girl, and that made me panic. If they got in, there was nothing I would be able to do to stop them. Not for me, and not for my friends either. But we would have been completely at the mercy of the monster outside. Jess had practically stopped breathing at this point, it was like the oxygen had been sucked out of the air. It was so quiet that it honestly sounded like a gunshot when our mailbox opened. Anne ran back down the stairs. I see the sirens. They're coming down the main road now, she whispered, hoping not to have the men here. The same man spoke again one more time so slowly that I almost thought that he was done after each word. In that same awful calm voice, he read out a letter addressed to the four of us. Our neighbor must have put it in today. She had planned a potluck for the next week. None of us thought to check the mailbox after we had talked to her in the driveway this morning. He said, Jess, Meg, Anne. Those are nice names. I'll be back soon, girls. Then we'll have some fun. I felt tears rolling down my face. I hadn't realized that I had started crying. But I knew that he meant what he had said. I tried to pull my mind out of the dark pit that that sentence had sent it to, waiting, praying that the police had surprised them, hoping that they would not get the chance to come back. The silence continued, none of us dared to speak, worried that we would not hear if they moved to another point of entry. Instead, the silence persisted for what felt like a lifetime. The operator was the first one to speak again, telling us that the police are out front. 
She told us to stay in the house until the police knocked on the door. The kind woman stayed on the phone with us for several more minutes while the police searched around the area. Finally, the real police showed their badge to the people before even knocking to try not to scare us. The operator told us that we had done well and that we were in good hands now. We opened the door to be met by two kind-looking older police officers who we let in. Glass shards covered our front stoop from our porch light. It looked like it had been ripped out of the wall and smashed onto the concrete below. There were several police cars out front of our previously quiet home. The headlights on all of the cars were shining down the street towards the walking trail. We spoke to the officers who took a report from us. They asked us to describe the night's events in detail. They asked us if we had saw them at all and we explained how the peephole had been covered and the light had been smashed before moving away from the door. The officers advised us to speak to our landlord about, at the very least, security cameras. The older officer then closed the pad that he had been writing in and looked at us. He then spoke a phrase that made me understand how much danger that we had actually been in. Look, if any of you were my daughters, I would have wanted the officer to tell her, if you can get out of your lease, then you should do it. They know where you all live and they also know the response time for us, especially after telling you all that they would be back. After that, they asked us if we heard a vehicle. That was something that I hadn't considered, actually. We didn't hear any type of motor, actually, until the police were there. Even when Meg and Anne had gone to look for a police car, they saw no cars on the street at all. So likely that meant that they had come from walking the path, which would explain how they left without passing the police on their way back to the main road. The older officer of the two had a look that told me that he had an idea of what was going on. He looked sad, which was worse than if he had looked scared. I knew that he had seen this situation end far worse in the past. We pushed for an explanation, but were only told that this had been an issue years ago, but did not elaborate past that point. The officers stood up, exchanged a glance that I didn't know how to read, and then spoke again. We'll have a cruiser parked in the driveway, as well as a plane car around the back. They'll have no chance to try again. They did not catch the men in the two more weeks that we lived there. We had a few other creepy things happen, but nothing close to this. The reality was that they had not been caught and they could come back any time. After this night, we spoke to our landlady, who was incredible. She owned several properties around the city, and when we explained what had happened, she let us move to an apartment closer to the campus. She told us that our safety is more important than making a few hundred dollars, she even left the house empty for many months in order to make sure cameras, better locks, and reinforced back door was installed. Thankfully, they didn't seem to come back and we were able to enjoy our new apartment without worrying. But this was definitely the scariest thing to ever happen to me. Especially that voice. A voice that I will have seared in my mind for as long as I live. My advice? Make sure you lock your doors and check whoever's there before even opening it because you just never know if something like this could happen to you. The Trans Alec Henny Lunatic Asylum, formerly known as Western State Hospital, is a Kirkbride building that housed the mentally ill from 1864 to 1994. In 2007, it was privately purchased and has become a museum or historic location and ghost hunting spot. It has a most unpleasant and dark history that I've regaled to thousands of people and it pains me to be an expert on the subject. In 2021, I retired from my position as a guide and ghost hunt event manager under severe burnout. After all that I experienced there, it solidified in my mind that paranormal things that defy rational explanation do indeed happen, and certain phenomena are absolutely real, electronic voice phenomenon especially. It's pretty much October now, and I'm feeling a little spooky, so here are a couple of strange things that I've experienced in my time there. So one evening, while training for the job, I was on the first floor with a couple of co-workers while everyone else was touring upstairs. But we were just kind of killing time, quietly observing the area. Light from outside was coming in through the windows, casting on the inner hall's wall. And in that light, I watched the perfect silhouette of a man from head to hip walk through that light from left to right. I said something about it, and 
The three of us watched as an arm and hand moved into the light from the right side. I immediately ran into the room and began looking out of the window for someone outside, but there was no one there. At that time, the realization that from the ground to the bottom of the window is like seven feet didn't even occur to me, but I will never forget the crisp, clear silhouette shape for as long as I live. But we would run experiments too with a spirit box. It sort of rapidly scans radio frequencies and are believed to be communication devices. One person would use one with the noise-canceling earbuds. All they're able to hear is the radio static and blips of a few random stations. And when they hear a word or a phrase, they are to say it out loud. I always liked this role in the experiment too. Now one evening, my co-worker and I ran one of these experiments in a notorious room where a murder in 1987 took place. For ten minutes, I sat and listened to nothing but radio static through the spirit box. No blips of the radio, nothing except the sound of static. I was starting to get bored in fact when I heard a woman's voice say evil. So I spoke up and repeated the word evil. Next thing I know my co-worker is shining her flashlight in my face to get my attention. I pull out the earbud and she was practically frantic saying, It's time to go, time to go now. So we haul Butt out of the room down the hall, down the next hall to the center section before she would even tell me what happened. While I was hearing nothing but static, she said that she kept hearing what sounded like someone shuffling their feet and walking around just outside of the door. She said that she spoke up and asked, whoever is out in the hallway, are they nice? That was when I spoke out and said evil. In the wee hours one night as well, we figured that it would be cool to see what would happen if we shut all the doors of the ward. And one of the doors, as I was closing it, the knob twisted in my hand. I was not twisting the doorknob at all and it was forcibly pulled closed. I stood there for several moments opening and closing that door trying to replicate what had just happened, trying to explain it. Finally the person with me was like, what are you doing? It was really weird I admit but I had never felt invisible forces like that before. I had three people spend the night one night too and they had thermal imaging video. They set it up pointing down the hall where we would all watch on a tablet but we thought that it would be interesting to leave a device at the far end of the hall that would alarm if the field around it was disturbed. As one of the dudes walked down the hall to put it there, we could see his form on the thermal imaging, clearly human shaped in colors representing heat and warmth and all that. When he walked by one of those doorways about a fourth way down the ward, the shape of a head, neck, shoulders and upper body of a person in colors indicating cooler temperatures lean peeked out as he walked by. Like someone popped out of the room for a sec as he walked by to check him out. I've never seen anything like it and I won't forget it and would give my left testicle if I had one for a, a copy of that footage. And that happened a lot too, a guest capturing something far out and not sending a copy to us, which was really annoying but I did get to see a lot which I'm thankful for. Anyway, I want to end this by sharing something that absolutely changed me and that I still don't understand. I remember the exact night and time of those occurrences too. That's how profound and somewhat unsettling they were. June 3rd and June 4th of 2017 at 3.40 in the morning. So, June 3rd. After an hour or so of hearing females' voices, one instance even sounded like she had said my name, as well as banging around and footsteps, literally running sounds on that hardwood floor towards us, I sat quietly on the floor with a group. I started to feel dizzy, lightheaded and gross. I told myself that it was my imagination and that I would be fine. A few minutes later I started to feel this intense burning sensation on my lower back, just to the right of my spine. Again I told myself that it was all just my imagination. The burning sensation kept amping up though, getting worse and worse. I told myself that I didn't want to be that guy and say anything in front of these people, you know. Finally though it got to the point where I just had to say something. I asked my co-worker with us if there was anything there. She was like, oh my goodness, there on my lower back, just to the right of my spine, was a mark that looked like a burn or an abrasion, about three to four inches long and about one inch wide. Now, I'd seen other such claims made by visitors of scratch marks and the like, often written them off, and the marks were always gone within an hour at most. I had visible marking on my back for almost a week though, 
My nerves there, to this very day, often feel very weird too. Sometimes chilled, or sometimes like a skin soreness or something. Strangely as well, especially when I think about the experience. June 4th. Some part of the building, some time of night, because I just can't get enough right. I noticed that my voice recorder ran out of memory. So I'm holding it in my right hand, using the flashlight in my left so I could see what I was doing. And suddenly, I feel a burning sensation on the underside of my right forearm. I did a what the heck and shifted my flashlight to it. The person beside me and I watched as three welts began to appear down my arm. Needless to say, that blew my mind. It was one thing to see marks like that. It was a whole other to watch it as it happens on your own skin. And like the majority of other incidents that I'd heard about regarding these welts, those marks were gone within about 10 to 15 minutes. No lasting effects. Scared would probably be the wrong word for this, but I have none to describe my mind frame around these events. I took a week off from work after it to try and just process it all and was nervous being in that hallway for the rest of that summer. Like I said, I still don't know what to think about all this or believe, but I know what happened. I've got enough stories of experiences to probably fill a book at this point, but I'll leave you with these for now, and I'll add a, a final note about how constantly poking around in the dark and talking about past true horrors of human experiences day in and day out truly takes a bit of a toll spiritually and emotionally on you. Since my resignation, my mental health and overall level of happiness has greatly improved, I used to tell people for a while afterwards that it felt like I'd gotten out of a toxic relationship at that place. So it was probably for the best that I left, but I must admit, I'm still curious about that place. Still wonder if things are going on.